Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto was assigned to Asuma and Team 10. Mizuki never got to shoot his mouth off at Naruto the night he took the scroll of seals. Other than skipping a half manic monologue from him, what exactly did this change for everyone's favorite blonde ninja? Who knows? Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 54, Scramble Madness Ino was now back on her feet and her accelerated hangover from hell had subsided as she moved amongst a cotter of Naruto clones. One in original appearance, three transformed to look like most of Team 8 and Akamaru, and one hung to look like Tsunade. So, Naruto said in a bit firmer of a voice than anyone would have expected from him, are you good to fight? He sounded a touch miffed at her, for the first time in quite some while. It had been so long that Ino had forgotten that Naruto could get upset with her. And probably with good reason. If they had been forced to fight it out back in the dark at the hotel she would have been a liability. What had happened was an anomaly. She wasn't a drinker and had no designs on being one. I can fight. I'm better now. Ino said, a bit embarrassed at the state that she had been caught in. Really, what a way to play into the ditzy blonde stereotype. She decided to switch to Yamanaka clan telepathy to prove it to him, you're not mad at me are you? I shouldn't answer that right now. Naruto replied immediately. That of course meant yes. I made a mistake, and I can't even remember why I did it. Ino defended, not willing to drop blame all on herself just yet, Tsunade was way more careless than me. She drank 20 times what I did. Why does it piss you off even if I'm sober now? Nothing was the matter now, and it was never going to happen again, so what was the problem? She's earned the right Ino. Naruto projected a bit more heatedly. Sure, he got on Tsunade's case a lot, mostly for alcoholism and shitty luck, but he loved that old bat, and he knew full well she could kill him in a matter of minutes if push came to shove. She could probably kill anyone, and she's the best medic ever. She can probably process alcohol through her system in five minutes. You can't do that. Oh, so just because she can drink and shrug off being drunk that makes it okay for her, but I can't have three sips. It's not that you were drinking, it's that you did it on a mission. Goofing off on the job is cool, but you can't do that. Tsunade Bachin's the client here. Don't give me that client crap Naruto. She has to be just as aware as we are, and you barely said anything to her about it, so what's your deal with me? I don't want you to fuck up and get killed okay. Naruto blurted out as the argument seemed to escalate, if we had to stay in that hotel and fight in the dark you would have gotten killed. You wouldn't have been safe on my back, and you wouldn't have been aware enough to protect yourself. That's the last thing I want. Do you know what that would do to me? They fucked around freely and made asses of themselves at work as members of the Guardian Ninja, as was their right as all being borderline insane but no one ever drank or did anything on the job that could mess with their heads. That was the ultimate no-no, and for good reason. Too many things could go wrong too quickly on most missions if they were caught slipping. As they could see buildings near the end of the trees in the forest, Eno's expression changed to a more receptive one due to the silence that had emerged between all of the Naruto's and her. She didn't like it when Naruto was quiet around her. She'd had enough of not hearing his voice for three years and thinking of him actually being mad at her for real didn't sit well with her. She wasn't going to prostrate herself though. Not for something like this. He was mad because he cared, that much was obvious and she was sorry for that, and for being the reason that he felt that way, but she wasn't going to go spineless just because of it either. She had pride as a ninja that she'd earned over years of hard work too. She hadn't just been sitting on her ass waiting for her prince to return and whisk her away. Naruto couldn't just come back and treat her like they were still 13. In reality though, he'd spent three years working as a guardian. That was two entire years longer than he'd been an actual Kanaha ninja, and before they were teamed up they hadn't necessarily been the closest to say the least. Being originally forced together eventually brought them together, but being forced apart could have done just as much. Ino probably missed out on many of the experiences for better or for worse that made Naruto who he was now. While he was still mostly the same, some things were still noticeably different. Same with her. 
He missed out on several important events that occurred in her life from the time he and Shikamaru walked out of the village gates. Things that changed who she was, not just as a ninja but as a woman. She had nothing to prove to their contemporaries on Team 8, 7, and Team Guy, because they had been around and knew of most of it, even having experienced some of it themselves. They knew what she was capable of. But she still felt that Naruto didn't see her on the same level as himself and Shikamaru. She wasn't sure if Shikamaru did or not, but Naruto definitely didn't from how his first instinct was to do what they did when they were genin and to have her sit on Naruto's back while they were moving quickly just in case, as if her only go-to in a dangerous situation would be to aim her consciousness at the enemy and hope that it hit in one shot. She still resented their leaving the village. Because they missed so much. Because he missed so much. Things that she took pride in. Things that let her believe that they'd be proud of her to know about them. Even when they moved out of the forest and into the small fishing village that had originally been meant to serve as the second rendezvous point, neither of them could find it in them to say anything, either to apologize or otherwise. So they didn't say anything about it at all. They were on the clock so to speak anyway, the fishing village is a good enough place to set the ambush if we're going to pull one isn't it? Ino said as they landed on the rooftop of the first shack. Naruto took a moment to look out around and get a quick sense of their bearings. It was basically a shanty town of wooden shacks, some of which could have barely been considered homes. And people used to live there? It made him glad that Okumizuchimaki was such a successful place and that this place had been abandoned, because even the town that had hosted them in Nami no Kuni as kids didn't look half as bad as that place. Okay, parameters. Naruto mentally projected through the connection with Ino in order to answer her question, we have none. This entire place is expendable as far as I'm concerned, so feel free to get creative with the ideas once we get them here. We just need to get them into the village, period. Back to the situation at hand it seemed. Looking around, Ino clicked her tongue before beginning to pull out some trap-making equipment. She didn't think she had enough material on her for a squad as big as the one that Hinata had been alluding to, but then again they might not have needed it. The village they were in was supposed to be the first area that they were all supposed to meet up at in case they were split up. While Tsunade, Hinata, and Shino had moved forward, the others all would have gone to this little village to try and meet up first before going to what was supposed to be the second spot, thanks to Shikamaru and his micromanaging. So when the others tried to link back up it would have been at that spot, which meant that the odds would have been evened up. They were still planning on fighting Umbu though, which was not a sexy sounding idea under any circumstances where the numbers were not on their side, but at least it would have been less of a man advantage for the enemy. Man. Naruto said, his clones still disguised as Tsunade and company took up positions to look like guards protecting a VIP for the sake of the show while the original started pacing around and thinking of where he could and would set up his own traps, I've never had to take on an Umbu before. This is a new one. We're taking on more than one. Eno groused out while trying to run tripwires between buildings for when the enemy arrived, so we're fighting to stall until we get more people here right. Naruto nodded, even though Eno couldn't see him due to her work. Speaking of which, he started preparing to get on his own, with explosive tags. There was no such thing as overkill, if he could take down a good number of umbu with explosives at least, that's the basic idea. If you can kill any of them that would be great but guys like these are usually really good with traps. In other words they probably would find a way around or through them because they were umbu. Nighttime or not, they could hide those wires as well as they wanted to, it probably wouldn't matter. Fuck, there's no time for a mess of traps. One of Naruto's clones disguised as Shino said from where he had a perch to oversee the area in case someone was coming, I can feel unfamiliar people moving our way sooner than we thought. It's not 16 people either like Hinata-chan said either. It's just four. Just four? The implication wasn't lost on Ino or the original Naruto who proceeded to punch a nearby wooden building and collapse an entire wall, damn it. Unless they had a sensor, which if they did they would have jumped us in the pitch dark restaurant with the 12 they had at first, there's no way they figured out we split up. We covered their tracks. There was nothing they could do about it now. The situation had changed. Luckily it was now just four umbu against the two of them. Better than holding off 16 in a dilapidated fishing village, because Kami they were about to walk face first into a meat grinder on that one. Boss. 
Naruto's Shino clone said again to get its creator's attention, these don't look like Iwambu. What? Who the hell else was chasing them then? What do they look like then? Not Iwambu. Aren't you listening? I would dispel you if I didn't need you to sell this right now. I don't care boss. Shino clone droned, continuing to look out in the direction he could sense incoming mystery ninjas from, I'm a dude that's a copy of a dude, disguised as another dude. I'm you, so I have your memories, and you've done this a thousand times. I know the drill. Both Naruto and Ino looked at each other before he sighed and gestured for the clone to get down, just, get in position and act like Shino dem you. At least Shino clone was obedient if not belligerent and did as asked, the entire time Ino had moved next to Naruto in preparation for the arrival of their would-be assailants, arguing with yourself is a sign of insanity you know. You want to talk about it? She teased dryly. If we live, sure. Naruto replied under his breath as a set of blurs landed nearby, and to the surprise of Naruto they weren't Iwa or Suna people at all. This was definitely a new one, uh, can we help you? Kumo people. A squad of four ninjas wearing white flak jackets from Kumo Gakur, two men, two women. So Kumo had a stake in this now? Awesome. Who are you? The dark-skinned girl with red hair brazenly questioned Naruto's way, so Kanaha really does think they still have a stake over Tsunade? Even after all of these years of her cutting ties with them. Maybe Kanaha's sick of her. The dark-skinned white-haired young man said aloud as he idly rolled around a sucker in his mouth, yeah, and the whole bounty thing is a chance to get at her and get something big in return. It makes sense, because I heard that she kept an apprentice with her. They must have killed her and captured Tsunade. Naruto's transformed clones all looked at each other before the one disguised as Tsunade spoke up, no, that's not really accurate, at all. The clone then characterized up for its appearance, now what do you want? The tallest Kumonin, a dark-skinned man with shaggy white hair that covered one of his easygoing eyes walked forward, looking at Naruto and Ino before turning his attention to Tsunade clone. It was really uncanny just how much time Naruto had to have spent around Tsunade over the past few years. His clone had her posture and expression down perfectly, making it look like the consensus, most dangerous woman in the world, without question. We've come to discuss your, should we say allegiance? Derui said before introducing himself and his allies, My name is Derui, a Jonin of Kumo. This is Samui, another Jonin. A curt nod came from the aloof-looking blonde woman with him before Derui gestured to the redhead and the boy eating a sucker, these are Karui and Omoe. Fantastic. Tsunade clone deadpanned, now what about my allegiance? Karui didn't like the attitude of the sunin, but she kept her temper enough and checked to find something to say, well you haven't called Kanaha home in decades. It's on record that you hate the village and the idea of being a ninja there. So the Raikage wants to offer you a position in Kumo, and he's definitely willing to negotiate with you to make it happen. You could probably get next to anything you want within the Raikage's power if you were willing to hear him out. Samui said, keeping a cool glance on the Kanaha shinobi also listening to the conversation. Why the hell did some of them look familiar? One was apparently a Hyuga, another other with sunglasses was covered up quite a bit so she couldn't recognize anything about him, and the last two fair-haired ninjas were Dash. Wait, she did know them. It had been years, but yes she remembered who they were. When you were knocked out of the Chunin exams finale in the first round you tended to remember the batch of rookies that went on to win it. Uzumaki Naruto and Yamanaka Ino yes. Samui asked, pointing right at a confused Naruto and Ino that hadn't expected anyone to actually address them directly as long as Tsunade was there. Once again though, Naruto was dreading this, because people that knew his name generally didn't want to shake his hand or give him ramen coupons, what exactly is Kanaha trying to do here with Tsunade-sama? We're taking her to get rid of a bounty on her head. Ino said, looking over at Naruto with a shrug. What would the point of lying be? You had to pick and choose what you chose to lie about, so that when you finally started bluffing someone would take it easier. Ninja Psychology If Tsunade hated Kanaha why would she hire Kanaha ninjas? But then again she probably stuck around Hai no Kuni more often than not, and Kanaha was the only game in town so to speak in regards to hiring for something like that unless she wanted to leave the country and risk running up against other villages that might have had a long-standing grudge against her. 
Well we're willing to wait and return with her once you complete your mission. Darui said, continuing his attempt at diplomacy, or if she would prefer we can take the responsibility off of your hands and escort her the rest of the way. Naruto didn't like the sound of that at all. It didn't sound like any of those choices involved turning down the offer outright without going to Kumo first, we can't really do that or we'd fail. He tried to reason, but you're not going to let us leave unless she goes with you, are you? We can't really fail either. Omoe said almost apologetically, trust me, the Raikage is not the man to mess up a mission for. You're really going to fight me? Tsunade clone said, cracking its knuckles and chuckling darkly in order to intimidate the Kumo squad into backing down, just because I'm a medic, don't think I have any problems with putting any of you in the hospital, or the morgue. Miles away in the forest. Tsunade's mouth involuntarily twitched into a smile that she quickly put away, what the hell was that? She thought to herself, turning for a second to look back in the direction that she, Shino, Akamaru, and Hinata had left Naruto and Ino to go off in. The prospect of fighting Tsunade got Karui and Omoe to intelligently step back, but Samui's eyes were locked onto something that wasn't there, or more accurately something that was there, but wasn't where it should have been, Uzumaki-san, why do you have Tsunade-sama's necklace? Naruto touched at the gem sitting against his chest without looking away, how do you know about this thing? Tsunade-sama is an idol to many kunoichi around the elemental nations. Samui explained calmly, staring a hole right through him. She had of course been including herself in the wide characterization of the modern female ninja, I know of the famous cursed necklace of the Shodai Hokage. So why would it be on you? Because I gave it to him. Tsunade clone replied, he earned it. Ino fought the urge to roll her eyes as even at a time like this Naruto couldn't help but toot his own horn, is there a problem with that? Yes, there may be. Derui said, quickly catching onto the drift of what Samui was alluding to, that necklace is supposed to be one of the things that were meant to prove Tsunade's identity. It's supposed to be synonymous with her. And now it's on some random Kanaha ninja. I'm not random you dick. Naruto bristled in rebuttal to the pseudo-insult. Back to the point. Derui continued, I'm saying that this isn't Tsunade. Why would she cough up a priceless possession such as that to some kid? Some kid from Kanaha, a place she was supposed to hate. Tsunade clone crossed its arms over its sizable transformed chest, how did she function normally with those things, and sneered forward, well then who am I smartass? That's what I plan on finding out, right before I get you to tell me where the real Tsunade is. Apparently he wasn't too fond of being deceived, because Derui drew a giant foldable cleaver with an exceptionally large handle and stormed forth at Naruto's mess of diversionary clones. The best way to find out if someone was who they said they were was to fight them, and Naruto couldn't fight like Tsunade so he couldn't sell the ruse any further. Luckily, he thought that the ringleader of the whole thing was whoever was transformed into Tsunade. He was wrong, and Naruto and Ino tried to take advantage of this by running away again, until they were cut off by both Kurui and Omoe blocking their retreat from front and back, Kumoriu Mikazukajiri, cloud-style crescent moon beheading. Both of them swung their swords in a flashing crescent arc, attempting to cut off most of the ways that their two targets could move in. Not particularly a fan of being surrounded and being cut down alongside one of his closest friends, Naruto was not about to humor the pair of swordsmen with a two-on-one duel with his machete. Not when he could just blow them away, Fumin no Jutsu, Wind Ripple Jutsu. Pushing Chakra from his body in all directions as if he were utilizing his sonar, only nature transformed into wind, Naruto blew both Kurui and Omoe away from himself and Ino before an edge of a sword even touched them, get out of my face. Both Naruto and Ino separated by pushing each other away and moving in opposite directions. Naruto cursed as Derui had managed to finish his clones off using some strange electric jutsu he'd never come up against before. So there they were, four on two, stuck in the fishing village with no traps set for them to take advantage of, and not willing to move to the next rendezvous point out of risk of compromising it for the others. Not the best of odds. But it was still better than the alternative of taking on the umbu. Upon getting her feet back underneath her, Ino heard the unsheathing of another bladed weapon and sighed before ducking a slash of a tonto from the heavy-chested Samui. Fast enough to avoid the attack, Ino stood back up and lashed out with a kick in return that didn't make contact in return. Turning around, 
Ino positioned her hands in the seal for one of her clan techniques and smirked when she saw Samui balk at the prospect of losing control of her body, stopping herself from attacking even though Ino's hand posture was a feint. Instead of firing a jutsu, Senban popped into her hand that she was prepared to throw until Karui appeared back in front of Samui, ready to intervene. Come on, what did you hesitate for? Karui asked Samui as the two Kumo Kunoichi stood together, getting Ino to back down from wasting Senban that would probably just be dodged or deflected, we could have attacked her from two sides if you'd have kept going forward. She's a Yamanaka. Samui pointed out, mimicking the hand seal that Ino made moments before, if you see her make any seal like this, disengage to make sure she misses or you'll lose control of your body. The prospect of someone taking over her body actually got Karui to cringe a bit. Oh, people know about us in Kumo. Ino said, the moonlight in her eyes dancing treacherously, I'm not surprised since we've been around for generations. But I wonder how outdated your intel on my clan is. Kanaha and Kumo haven't fought each other in a long time. It doesn't matter. Samui said, her confidence not shaken. Why would it have been? She had the advantage, even before Karui showed herself, members of the Yamanaka clan are notoriously bad at taijutsu. And I don't see a single melee weapon anywhere on her pretty little ass. Karui finished brazenly, holding up her own katana, there's a reason Kumo has so many sword users. Bad at taijutsu? Ino thought to herself with a frown on her face, yeah, we're not the best even daddy, but flat out bad at it. We're better than the Nara clan at it. I'll tell you what. If you think you can get close enough to me with those toothpicks to hurt me without getting yourselves killed, feel free dash. No, feel encouraged to try. She challenged with a narrowing of her eyes. Was it smart to say? Not particularly. But the Kumo redhead was definitely going to spend the entire fight trying to burfucate her anyway. So did it really matter if Eno tried to piss her off further? At least this way she'd be more prone to mistakes. Both Karui and Samui nodded to each other before Karui rushed forward to put Eno's threat to the test, Kumoriu Omotagiri, cloud-style front beheading. Karui swung her sword at Eno in a powerful horizontal motion that she was able to avoid, but cut through an entire wooden building cleanly in one move. And on the move Eno hit Karui with the handful of poisoned senbon she'd been holding, but it felt a little too easy. Quickly throwing her hands together in the ram seal, Ino disturbed her own chakra flow enough to break a genjutsu that had been cast over her before something bad could happen, fuck, a decent genjutsu user and someone that's going to rush me the whole time. She really hoped that Naruto wasn't having as much trouble. Boss. Clang. What clone me? Clang. Does everyone in Kumo know how to use a sword? Seems like it. Makes us seem prophetic for picking up something for ourselves doesn't it? Ah, switch. Naruto and his clone substituted with each other as Derui and Omoe moved in with their respective blade weapons to cut them down. The pair of dark-skinned men were thwarted by the sudden switch off of Naruto's, but the battle still continued nonetheless, with the original Naruto fighting against Omoe while his clone fought Derui. Derui's eyes couldn't help but keep flickering to Naruto's choice of weapon in a simple machete. Strange, but then again with his own foldable cleaver sword he couldn't say much about strange weaponry, he shouldn't have the range to feel confident in fighting against a real swordsman. And just like that after Naruto whiffed on a machete slash, Derui realized why. The chain attached to the hilt of his machete was a lot longer than he first figured it to be and it almost smashed off of his face and broke his nose when Naruto tried to use it as a bludgeoning tool. Or a tool that would have torn his face off, because it got close enough for him to hear it cut through the wind. So that was why he was so confident in his abilities in close, because he had more than one weapon. For Omoe, Naruto's chain was a much more annoying tool that he used to defend himself effectively instead of attacking. Instead of blocking any of Omoe's long katana attacks, Naruto would use his chakra chain to deal with the sword whenever it got close enough to possibly do any damage to him. How did someone learn how to fight effectively against a trained swordsman with just a chain? A stray movement ended with the chain wrapped around Amwa's sword trying to pull it out of his hands. While Omoe didn't let go, he probably should have when Naruto dug his feet in and pulled hard, yanking him forward and off of his feet. Derui witnessed this happen and swung a sword at Naruto to force some space between them so that he could create a hand seal, Omoe get up. Raiden, Kurapansa, 
Lightning release, Black Panther. He created a dangerous looking panther out of black lightning that flew at Naruto's clone and electrocuted it brutally into non existence. There goes that black lightning jutsu of his again. The real Naruto said with a slight sweat at his brow. That had been what he'd used to kill his clones at the outset of the fight. So you've heard of it? Darui asked, body still crackling with the aforementioned jutsu as Omoe got up and got back to his side, smarting from Naruto getting the edge on him earlier. He couldn't believe a clone had gotten him in such a predicament. Naruto shook his head and pulled out a quick cigarette. Hey, he hadn't had one in three days and if he was about to get killed he was going to go out on his terms. They'd already been caught after all, no, not really. I mean, it's black and it's lightning. I really don't know what else I would have called it. Omoe shook his head at the sight of Naruto lighting up the end of the cigarette, but he didn't attack him. If Darui didn't see it as an opening, there was probably a good reason for it. Attacking was probably what Naruto wanted, you know, smoking is a really bad habit. Why would you do something like that that's so bad for you? The Raikage completely outlawed smoking within his ninja ranks. Woe to the one that was caught smoking while on the Kumogakura roster. The man was almost obsessive about health not just for himself, but for everyone else under him. It's a long story. Naruto said blankly, way used to this song and dance for years already by now, if it makes you feel any better Surgeon General, it gave me the idea for a special ninjutsu style. He'd have told him off, but he was sick of defending himself about it. Kicking someone's ass was such a better way to handle that problem, so let's try this again. Both Naruto and Derui Shun shined away while Omoe leapt off in the direction that he felt them move in to catch up and stay in the battle. Naruto reappeared on a rooftop of the shanty town village first before Derui did as well, coming close enough to cutting Naruto's head to slice the embers off of the end of his cigarette. From behind, Naruto was stabbed by Amwa's katana much to his surprise until his body started to turn to a blackened ash that stuck stubbornly to the sword in clumps. Trying to rub and scrape the gunk off with his hands resulted in them being burned by the steaming hot ash and tar that comprised Naruto's ash clones. Upon hearing Amwa's burned shout of surprised pain, the real Naruto crashed through a ceiling from underneath near Derui. While that one attacked, another did the same from another side, diverting his attention. One hit the side of Derui's legs with its entire body while the other stomp kicked the man in the face, knocking him down and drilling his herd into the roof hard enough to smash it like a watermelon, bunch in Haijo, clone elimination. This only resulted in Naruto finding a crushed chunk of rotten wood underneath his foot. A Kawarimi. That was kind of annoying he had to admit. And now both Omoe and Derui were gone and could be taking refuge anywhere with a wall in hundreds of shacks in that little hovel of a former fishing village. Okay, now it was really annoying. Meanwhile, forests around the outskirts of Okumizu Mimaki. It was basically the lumberjack special, with the sheer amount of trees chopped at the trunks by Damari's belligerently destructive wind jutsu. She really hoped that the town wouldn't be pissed at the loss of so much of their trees, but if they were she didn't care that much. Really, she was more concerned about the fact that Kankuro had been in there somewhere, moving so that Shikamaru didn't find him. Hopefully he'd been farther away than the range of her jutsu, because it had only really been the size of a full-sized playing field. She'd been controlled in her anger at the pineapple-haired prick that had done little more than run his mouth and run away from her, because she still needed him alive. She was certain he knew where Tsunade was. She was a professional after all, and wouldn't let her anger get in the way of a successful mission. But looking over the sheer amount of lumber she had cleared she coughed uncomfortably into her hand, Maybe I went a little too far. Maybe anyone caught in it would have wound up with crushed limbs and not completely crushed bodies. Think positive to Mary, think positive. A touch of movement caught her attention and upon heading in that direction, she found a sight that gave her a sigh of relief in the form of a large puppet of a salamander that she knew of fairly well, Kankuro, thank goodness. The puppet opened up enough that to Mary's face painted and hooded brother could be seen within, giving her an exasperated look. Did you have to bring down part of the whole place on my head just because that guy pissed you off? Sorry. But all of that big talk about shadows and dark, just to run for the hills when he got the chance. Tamari said with a scoff, I figured that team was full of big talkers that couldn't back it up. Now are you going to help me look for the bodies or what? Yeah, yeah. Kankuro said, 
using his puppet to push chunks of tree off of itself so he could help Tamari search the damage zone for the dead and slash or wounded. As they continued to walk, Tamari stopped for a split second while Kankuro continued forward as something had gotten her notice once again. Before he could ask what it was, Kankuro noticed it too and cursed as from their respective positions both siblings placed their hands in a ram seal, Kai. The environmental genjutsu cast over them both was broken just in time to see a rather large young man in red armor falling from the air with giant arms ready to smash down on them both. A yell of alarm quite uncharacteristic of the battle hardened soon a pair flew from their throats as they dodged and the massive hands proceeded to break some of the fallen tree trunks around. Sakura, they broke the genjutsu. Chuji shouted after the enemy had dodged his attack, what the hell? You said it was in. And it had been. Sakura had done a basic copy rendering of their current environment, but since she had been hiding down by the trunks of trees that hadn't been cut down she couldn't feel that from where Tamari and Kankuro had been there was a small steady night breeze going. She'd copied everything else perfectly, but she couldn't add on what she hadn't been aware of to begin with, and that was how they broke free. Nice try princess. Tamari said, yelling out to the pink-haired girl that had managed to put her in another genjutsu earlier at the hotel. I thought you'd run away already. Kankuro. She shouted to her nearby brother who had somehow managed to hide that bulky puppet monstrosity he was taking cover inside of. Got it. Kankuro's voice projected around the area, oh wow, she's really cute. Makes me almost feel bad about this. Almost. From where she had been hiding amongst the trees, Sakura stepped her foot off of a trunk before backflipping off of it as several poison-coated kunai stabbed into the same tree and she caught sight of the freaky form of Kankuro's Karasu puppet, gliding around through the forest all around her. Some of them had explosive tags attached and Sakura quickly darted away from the tree before it was blown to hell. That really could have been her had she not been attentive enough. A whizzing noise alerted her to three saw blades connected to arms flying through the forest at her, why are you doing this? Kanaha and Suna are allies. That hasn't really been very beneficial to us. Kankuro said from wherever he was hiding while Sakura continued to dodge and search for him wherever he was, sure, we get more work and money than we used to back before, but that boost is only from the scraps that Kanaha hands off, like we're the little brother village to yours. It's emasculating. No wonder villages like Iwa still don't take us seriously and try to throw their weight around all the time. And having Tsunade is going to do what for you? Chuji asked, carefully staring down to Mary out in the open amongst the felled trees as the wind-based Kunoichi did the same against him, even if she is super strong, she's still just one person. One person that countered every poison that our village's expert put forth in the second shinobi world war and revolutionized the way that shinobi squads are put together forever. To Mary amended, you're telling me right now that you don't have anyone on your team that practices medical ninjutsu? They did. The one out of Team 7 that dabbled in it was currently being pursued by a weird six-armed humanoid arsenal puppet, the origin of which she couldn't get enough time to locate. Able to tell that this was the case from the look on Chuji's face, Tamari continued, there isn't anything that Suna won't do to get that kind of a military boon. An entire generation of field medic nin would change almost everything about the way we operate in mission. And that's just the beginning of what she could do for us. She's a Kanaha ninja. Not for the last 20 years she hasn't been. Tamari said as she drew her fan back for a swing, she's a free agent for all intents and purposes. Futon, Tatsu no Ashigoto, wind release, great task of the dragon. Instead of sending an attack right at Chuji, Tamari's wind flew up into the clouds and began manipulating them around overhead. Chuji was not willing to sit and wait to find out whatever she had cooked up, as he created two hand seals and started bringing his own fighting style into play, Baika no Jutsu, multi-size Jutsu. Chuji's entire body grew to 20 times its original size, giving him the appearance of a giant. Even when the tornado that had been spawned via Tamari's Jutsu fell from the skies, Chuji wasn't even taken off of his feet and had to smirk at the fact that she could barely budge him enough to take a step back. So he was so big she couldn't send him flying was he? That was fine. If that were the case she could always just use her wind to cut chunks out of him until he dropped. That would certainly work for her. Before she could even draw her arms back to swing her fan again, Chuji channeled Chukra to his hands and smashed them down into the ground through the tree trunks littering the area, Chuharite, 
super open hand slap. A miniature earthquake took place with debris and chunks of wood flying up all over. Tamari had to cover up to keep safe before swinging her fan to send all of the materials in the air away so that she could see. See the gigantic palm heading right her way that she was barely able to use her iron fan to protect herself from. Even so, she still wound up coughing blood from the hit that rattled her insides around. But instead of crashing into wood or against the rough, hard ground she got a much softer bed to land in when she was caught out of the air by sand. Surprise at not taking catastrophic injury from Chuji's overwhelming attack that she still should have been feeling the pain gave way to a feeling of victory when she realized that they weren't in Kaze no Kuni, so there was one reason sand would be there. And that reason would kill everyone standing against them. Where have you been Gara? Tamari asked as she was carefully placed down on the ground by her youngest brother's sand, you were going to spend some time outside so you should have noticed everything that happened. I had my own opponents to deal with. Gara stated in the chillingly calm tone that Tamari had long since gotten used to. Even if he wasn't threatening anyone, that was just how Gara spoke, I was actually looking for them when I found that you had raised a quarter mile of forest to the ground. Tamari had the good grace to blush as Gara looked at the gigantic form of Chuji right ahead of them, of course considering your opponent I guess it is understandable. Upon seeing Gara and remembering just what that person was capable of back when they were all kids, Chuji shouted out in alarm. Sakura. She didn't need to hear it again as she started trying to extricate herself from her conflict with Kankuro's puppet to try and get back over to Chuji. Fighting with a puppet that she couldn't find a way to disable was a little out of her comfort zone. A dodge to avoid a set of explosive pellets from Karasu led to Sakura falling into a well-concealed opening that quickly closed off and trapped her inside. Ah, gotcha Kanaha babe. Kankuro said from his hiding place as his puppet revealed more of itself such as its horned head, six thin arms, and two thin legs like Karasu's, it was only a matter of time before your focus slipped and you fell into Kuro Eri. Kuro Hiji Kiki Apatsu, Black Secret Technique Machine One Shot. Segments of Karasu broke off revealing blades hidden in the body parts before they stabbed into openings on Kuro Eri to impale Sakura. The resulting scream sounded like victory, but there was no blood. And he couldn't take Karasu's parts out of Kuro Eri either. Growling to himself, Kankuro broke the genjutsu again to find Sakura was sitting on giant Chuji's shoulder, Magan, showery no kodii, demonic illusion, stroke of victory, dot. When did you put a genjutsu on me you bitch? You don't even know where I am. I know where your stupid puppet is though. Sakura replied, not trapped, or impaled at all, and your puppet is controlled by your chakra thread connecting it to you. I can use the puppet like a light switch to turn on the light bulb so to speak. If I cast a genjutsu on your puppet I can creep control over to you depending on how far away you are from the damn thing. She extended her chakra flow through his chakra thread all the way back to him and his brain to slip a genjutsu on him. For fuck's sake, what kind of chakra control did something like that take? From her place on Chuji's shoulder, Sakura had as close to a bird's eye view of the battlefield as she was going to get. It was now three on two, and one of their enemies was that scary Gara guy, what do we do now? She asked Chuji who didn't really have a way to respond. If we're going to retreat we're going to need to get creative, because Sasuke and Kiba aren't here. Chuji said, bringing up their entire reason for being away from the bulk of their squad. Enough. Gara said with his arms crossed over his chest, where is Tsunade? No response from the Kanaha contingent, if that is your choice. He said, waving his hand to manipulate his sand directly in front of himself, so be it. Rendon, Suna Shigure, successive shots, sand drizzle, dot. Gara fired dozens of high-speed sand bullets at Chuji who crossed his arms and blocked the attack with his body due to his inability to dodge. He had to use that size and durability of his to his advantage. He wore that armor for a reason. Even so, the impact of all of the sand projectiles were pounding the air out of him. In a bid to assist her teammate, Sakura wrapped an explosive tag around a kunai before launching it at Gara only for his sand to stop it and cover it entirely. The sand muffled the explosion from the tag and left Gara and his siblings entirely unharmed. Gara began making hand seals, completely unshaken by Chuji's sturdy body standing up to his previous jutsu, it seems as if your size isn't for nothing Akimika-san. I'll have to fight you to scale then. Suna no Aizuki Meisou, Sand Ruin Burial. Underneath Chuji, 
The ground loosened and a torrent of sand flew up in large enough amounts to surround his entire body. Tamari swung her fan and guided all of it into a spinning pillar of sand that seemed as if it could peel skin from bones. As it died down though, there was no bloody Chuji skeleton within. Instead it was an uprooted tree with the bark entirely peeled off of it. Without the powerful winds to hold it upright it fell to the ground in a crash, and neither Chuji nor Sakura were there to be seen. Another Genjutsu? It had to be something like that, because Chuji didn't have that much speed to avoid the combination Jutsu altogether, nor did anyone have the power to just force their way out of a razor-sharp tunnel of sand. Kawaraikage no Jutsu, Shadow Replacement Jutsu, dot. That seemingly bored voice despite the fact that there was a battle going on. Tamari involuntarily grit her teeth in anger at the sound of it. From the trees, the top of Chuji's spiky brown hair could be seen as he walked back into plainer view with a smaller figure down at his feet doing the same, hands shoved into the pockets of his leather jacket, I didn't know you could do that with a tree stuck in the ground Shikamaru. Chuji commented. Shikamaru kept his eyes on the group in front of him with a perturbed look on his face. Getting tons of trees cut down on top of your head would put one in a foul mood, I can teleport anything similar in size. You're as tall and as heavy as a tree bud. How did you not die? Tamari blurted out in anger at seeing him still standing, with not so much as a fractured limb for all of the trouble she went through. Shikamaru just fixed her with a passing glance, Lady, I'm talking with my friends here. I will deal with you and your brothers in just a minute. All that did was get Tamari to fume and punch at her iron fan out of anger. Gara gave her a slightly wary glance but said nothing, Hey Sasuke, we're friends right? Tamari and Gara's eyes widened at the slight sound of chirping as his sand moved to defend them both, but apparently not fast enough as a pair of lightning-covered hands shoved through their chests from behind, task. Their bodies then turned to sand and everyone looked up to see both Gara and Tamari suspended in the air by a platform of Gara's sand, fuck off Shikamaru. Needless to say, he was not happy at his targets dodging his double Chidori, even if it wasn't the fault of the Nara genius. The best. Shikamaru muttered sarcastically while Sakura was set down on the ground by Chuji's hand, so what are you guys even doing here? He asked the pink-haired Kunoichi. Looking for Sasuke Kun and Kiba. Sakura said, relieved at seeing Sasuke was alright. But wait, where's Kiba? Shikamaru just smirked. Nearby in the forest. I'm coming for you dandy man. Kiba said in a fearily gruff manner as he rushed high speed through the trees, you can't hide from me. At his side, Karasu appeared, clicking noises going off to intimidate his enemy, but intimidation was the last thing that Kiba was thinking of, even when the puppet brandished a decent amount of its arsenal to try and bring him down, mostly consisting of multiple hidden blades and a giant poisoned needle in its mouth. Kiba dropped a smoke bomb that prompted Karasu to riddle the cloud with an assortment of poisoned kunai, senbon, and poison gas only for it all to clear away to reveal Kiba wasn't there. Instead there was only a hole in the ground, and right then Kankuro realized how Kiba, Shikamaru, and Sasuke were able to survive Tamari's attack if the Inuzuka clan member could use a jutsu that would allow him to do such a thing so quickly. Tsuga, passing Fang. The ground underneath Kankuro's hiding place burst out with Kiba spinning his body like an active drill, knocking against the heavily defensive side of Kankuro's sturdy third puppet Sanshao, almost tipping it over entirely. How did you even find me? Kankuro asked as he continued to take refuge inside of Sanshao while waiting for his other two puppets to get close enough for him to fight Kiba off again. You smell like machinery oil, steak, and fear. Kiba said, the fear's the most important part. It's also my favorite part. Not good at fighting in close dude. He intentionally brandished his sharpened fingernails for emphasis, that's too bad. This was salvageable. All Kankuro had to do was get some more space and throw forth a full court press onto Kiba. Inuzuka clan members were notoriously bad at distance fighting. And right on cue, Kuroeri attacked Kiba with its body open to try and capture him. Far too quick for such a direct approach. Kiba turned in the air from a jump and kicked the puppet in the head, spinning it on the body like a top. With Karasu moving in to pick up the slack and continue pursuing Kiba, Kankuro sealed Sanshao away before choosing to move along to a new hiding place. Out of the corner of his eye, Kiba caught the movement and wasn't having any of that, nuh-uh. You ain't hiding again pal. Of all things to do, 
He unbuckled his pants and jumped into the air with the most wicked grin imaginable on his face. Akamara wasn't here so it had to be him to do this, this one's for you boy. Gah. Oh, you disgusting motherfucker. I'm gonna murder you. A gigantic explosion from within the forest soon gave way to a slightly burnt, soot-covered Kiba running as fast as he could while buckling his pants into the clear-cut area where his allies were, Hey Sakura, Chuji, what's up? He asked hurriedly, constantly looking behind himself to where he had come from as if he expected something bad to come his way. Sakura raised an eyebrow but answered nonetheless, we came to get you and Sasuke-kun to get all of us moving to the rendezvous point before a big squad of Iwaambu that outnumbers us all together caught everyone, but we hit a little bump. A sandy bump that could crush them and kill them all. I noticed. Kiba deadpanned, still looking out for an irate puppeteer to be coming that way any moment, so now what? Sasuke apparently had the answer, at least from his point of view, who knows what else could be happening with Tsunade and the others right now. He said, never taking his eyes off of Gara and Tamari in the air, it would probably be best to link back up with our original teams, or at least to put as many bodies on Tsunade as we can. Kiba and Shikamaru should go. We can handle them ourselves. A frown crossed Shikamaru's face at hearing that. True, it was probably the first thing that would have come to mind for him, but it left too many people out on the vine. True, Naruto and Ino were amongst those being pursued by the alleged Iwaambu that Sakura spoke of, but if there was one thing he detested it was the default plan to split off and deal with problems as they came. There had to be another way, if only there was time to come up with one. He was about to do his best to come up with something until he heard the gigantic Chuji behind him clear his throat. Turning around, Shikamaru looked up to see his old friend smiling down at him, it's not like you're leaving us at a disadvantage here. The odds are even. You guys sure? Kiba asked, raising an eyebrow at the more ahem delicate member of Team 7 in Sakura, who didn't seem to be very taken aback at all in the face of the pending battle, I mean, we've got 5 here against 3. And the others have got 12 to 16 Umbu to their 5. 6 counting Akamaru. Sakura replied, and that was all Kiba needed to hear before deciding that they did need to link back up with the others. He yelled for Shikamaru to follow him which the strategist did, but reluctantly. Gara watched all of this from above, having never taken his eyes off of Sasuke the way that Sasuke had never taken his eyes off of him. It doesn't matter if they run or not. Gara said plainly, we'll finish you and follow them back to Tsunade. If you want to do this the hard way we have no problem with accommodating you. Just because you're up there doesn't mean we still can't bring you down. Sasuke said with a smirk, excited at getting a fair shake at fighting someone that had a real reputation in the world. A few more seconds of staring led Gara to gesture to Damari with his head, prompting her to leave his suspended platform to engage Sakura and Chuji again. He wanted to fight Sasuke himself if that was indeed the challenge being laid down. And he maneuvered himself in the air away from the others to a location a short ways away. It could be said that they would have needed the space. Sasuke fled from him when they were atop the hotel. Gara didn't really expect more out of him in this meeting, but his blood was boiling for a fight and he was going to take the opportunity for one. It had been a while since he'd fought against someone that would have actually been fun to kill. As he lowered himself to the ground, Sasuke just waited for him to finish descending, to which Gara raised a non-existent eyebrow, why haven't you taken the opportunity to attack me yet? Some fool thing like honor. No, not at all. Sasuke said, tapping his temple as he spoke, I'm just thinking. More like wondering really. After I get rid of all of that sand of yours, I wonder just how good of a shot you can really take. Gara's face didn't change or show that he'd risen to the semi-threat at all, do you remember what I said about hating the nighttime? That goes double for full moons. It makes me rather, testy. With that he split his abundance of sand into three segments and sent two of them at Sasuke. Sasuke drew his gun bay from his back and swung it at the ground, throwing up a torrent of flame that Gara's sand quickly put out only to find that Sasuke wasn't there. Gara's third portion of sand quickly moved to protect the Shukakujin Shuriki, grabbing hold of Sasuke's sharp-edged war fan before he could try and lop off a portion of Gara's body. The sand crept up the weapon along the handle until Sasuke let it go and backflipped away before the offensive portions of Gara's sand could surround and capture him. As he moved away, 
An end of wire sat in Sasuke's mouth and he rolled through hand seals before utilizing a jutsu, katon, ryuken no jutsu, fire release, dragon fire jutsu. Fire traveled from Sasuke's mouth down the length of the wire until it reached the handle of his gun bay and caught the entire weapon in flames. With a jerk of his head, Sasuke pulled the flaming weapon free from the scorched sand and back into one of his hands. He formed a half-tiger seal with one hand and swung the fan, sending several flaming, winged creatures out directly at Gara as they seemed homed in on him with screeching noises emitting from them, Katon, Koshitsu no Tsubasa, fire release, imperial wings. They exploded on contact with Gara's sand shield, one after another in a fiery display, but did absolutely nothing to bring it down, mere explosions aren't enough to weaken my sand defenses any longer. Gara sent his sand back out at Sasuke to crush the young man without fear of any sort of reprisal from him, there are more productive ways to commit suicide just so you know. Ways that wouldn't have cost your teammates their lives either. I'm not worried about them, or about myself. Sasuke said as he continued to dodge up, around, and behind all of the fallen trees that Tamari had cut down, I wouldn't have volunteered us to stay and fight if I didn't believe that we couldn't beat you and your family. Oh really? Yeah. And if you think that a few fireballs are the best I've got, you've already forgotten my first move against you here, haven't you? With that, Sasuke's gun bay began to let off a small humming noise as small volts of electricity began to spring from it. Impressively, Sasuke's fan began to neutralize Gara's sand as it came into contact with it, much to Gara's shock. Just touching the fan seemed to cause Gara's waves of sand to dematerialize out of attack form and fall limply to the wayside for a short time so his mastery over elemental transformation extends to lightning just as well as fire. Gara thought to himself, breaking down just what Sasuke was doing to stop his sand, that first jutsu he tried on Tamari and I upon his arrival, it isn't all he is capable of with electricity. You might be a Jinchuriki. Sasuke said with a serious expression, twirling his gun bay around before holding it firmly in a two-handed grip, but I'm an Uchiha. So don't take me lightly. I don't take anyone lightly. Returned Gara as he returned all of his sand to around his body, but to your earlier question to me I have one of my own. I'm wondering myself, if I counteract your sherry non, just long would you be able to survive? That was something that was sort of confusing to Sasuke. In his mind what he'd said about Gara's sand made more sense. The sand was separate from Gara's body. Sasuke's eyes were attached inside of his head, and thinking about losing that made him physically ill. Maybe because it involved his eyes being plucked out and because he could see Gara gouging his eyes out with sand? Not a pleasant thought. Prepared to make a move, Sasuke felt a stinging at his eyes and ignored it after a blink or two, proceeding to storm forth to attack. During the Chunin exam years ago, Naruto and Team 10 had basically written the blueprint for how to defeat Sabaku no Gara. Even though it was probably far more difficult to take advantage of due to the years that had passed, the fact of the matter was that not only was it possible to get past his shield of sand, it was necessary if one wished to win against him. Sasuke's Sherinan allowed him to see the billowing layers of sand coming to intercept him and he was able to analyze any safe path in getting to Gara. He was able to see when a place was open, when it was closed off to him, when he was in danger, all of it. But his eyes kept on bothering him forcing him to break off in the middle of his attack pattern. Going in blind was worse than not going in at all. Upon seeing Sasuke move backwards, Gara sent several waves of sand at him that Sasuke repelled with the electricity flowing through his gun bay. He did not see a small tendril of sand wrap around his ankle and begin creeping up his leg, eventually dragging him to the ground. Sasuke could feel the sand coming his way and created a chidori in his right hand, ridding his leg of the sand around it before it was too late as a wave arched and crashed his way. Gara had to admit that Sasuke was incredibly quick to keep avoiding his sand. What the hell? Sasuke thought to himself as he continued keeping his distance from Gara after his failed attempt to maneuver past his defenses, wait, is he the one doing this? Taking a moment to focus on more than just the pending threat of Gara's personal sand, Sasuke smiled grimly at what he picked up on, didn't take you for the subtle type. I dabble in subtle from time to time. Gara said, taking a bit of wry humor out of Sasuke discovering that he was spacing out grains of sand in the air to irritate his eyes and force him into making mistakes, this isn't even my best one. My best was slowly getting enough sand little by little into an enemy's ear until I had enough to force it through his brain. 
it isn't always, crush my enemies, though that tends to be the easiest approach. Gara didn't even have to sacrifice a significant portion of sand to mess with Sasuke's vision, only the minutest amount was required. A stray grain of sand could scratch at his cornea. I really wish I had those stupid goggles Naruto wears right now. Sasuke thought to himself as he pondered his next move. And he only had so long to do it, because while Gara didn't move during battles he had his sand to do it for him. And it didn't seem like it would wait very long before it would come at him in force. With Tsunade and teammate, countryside of Hinokuni. Does anyone else need a soldier pill? Tsunade asked as she, Hinata, Shino, and Akamaru had stopped for a momentary spell to take full account of the situation. Also so that Hinata could rest her eyes for a short bit. Overuse of the Byakugan would keep her from being able to see even normally for a short time, we can't stop moving for long. Stopping again was not to be advised. Even stopping when they did was only done out of necessity. Hinata had kept up the Byakugan for two hours straight after turning it on and off for much of the day already. It's straight to the bounty station from here on out isn't it? Shino asked, keeping an eye on Akamaru who was steadily sniffing at the air for incoming enemies while Hinata was nursing her jujitsu for the time being, the sooner we get there and put an end to this the sooner this can all go away. That's the plan. Tsunade said, her hands blue as she checked the others over to ensure that they were still all fighting fit, like I said, if we keep moving at the pace we've been going we shouldn't make it there much later than just after sunrise. She then noticed Akamaru whimpering and barking to get their attention, maybe a bit later. Clapping could be heard in the open field that they were resting in, and everyone saw a pair of men walking their way, one with silver hair and a wicked looking scythe, the other tall and imposing with large stitch scars on his arms. The more heavily covered of the two with strange red and green eyes and the full face mask happened to be the one providing the sarcastic applause, well Mark, or should I say Senjutsu Nade, is there anything you have to say for yourself? Clearly they were Akatsuki, which meant that if they knew where Naruto was they would try to hurt him. That already put them on her shit list. She acted like the kid was a pain and in return he acted like she was a bothersome old lady, but the two of them cared very much for each other. She'd crack their skulls before they took his biju. Can I help you? Tsunade drawled with her hands on her hips. Herchanin and Ninkan associates were not as vocal as she was in facing off with such potential threats, wait, let me guess. Facial reconstructive surgery, and a lobotomy. She said, pointing to Kakuzu and Hidan respectively. Wahahahaha. Hidan cackled at Kakuzu's expense at the insult hurled his way before the second half of Tsunade's comment was processed by his brain, Oi, you bitch. I didn't even say anything yet. How are you going to call me crazy or stupid? Because you look crazy and stupid. Tsunade argued in return, besides, the legendary missing nin Kakuzu is obviously the brains of this outfit. Kakuzu chuckled deeply and stepped forward, I'm flattered that you know about me. Your grandfather disposed of me so casually all those years ago I figured that I was hardly a passing threat to him. It's not what you were that the stories were about, it's what you became after your village turned on you after your failure. Tsunade said, shaking her head at the thought of a hidden village selling its own up the river for going through with a mission that they assigned. Even in failure, to take on Senju Hashirama and to try and assassinate him was something that took incredible courage and conviction, I can hardly say I blame you but that's neither here nor there. The thought of what happened to him got Kakuzu's fists to clench in anger, cowards. I was their best. I bled for them. And they turn around and hike up their skirts the moment your grandfather came to them offering peace in return. Imprisoning me for following their orders just to make themselves look good. With that he let it all go and laughed to himself, but like you said, that is neither here nor there. I got my pound of flesh, left with the secrets of their most valuable techniques, and now the only thing I believe in is money. It never lets you down, it stays constant, and it's why I'm here now. Tsunade raised a delicate blonde eyebrow but said nothing as Hinata tried to observe just what their two new enemies were made of. Upon seeing them, she let out another small gasp. She was doing that quite a bit at the sight of these men. Only now she had a close-up view of what made them tick. Kakuzu's body really was like that of the Takigakuur boy that had beaten her team and then had been subsequently killed by Sasuke in the following round in the Chunin exam's final tournament. Only those four masks sewn into his back gave her pause. 
each of them radiated a different element of chakra, each of them making this man almost the textbook definition of a monster, because each of them contained a beating human heart. That was what that boy had been talking about all those years ago when he remarked on being interested in implanting her organs into his body. How sick! Tsunade sama! Hinata said quietly, that man Kakuzu, he has five hearts. I don't know what this means. A Hyuga. Kakuzu said, narrowing his eyes on Hinata's form, I never liked that clan. They never seem to know when to keep the things that they see to themselves. With that he waved his hand in the direction of the Kanaha squad, Sutton, Nami Shinda no Jutsu, water release, wave impact Jutsu. From the ground, Water shot out in a quick riptide-style wave that drenched the open field and would have shattered the bones of whomever it hit had everyone not moved aside. Wonderful. Kakuza said, once again clapping his hands, you dodged. I'd hate to have broken such a sweat and traveled all this way in such a rage just for a first-round knockout. Though admittedly killing all of those umbu really took a chunk off of the edge of his temper, show me your grandfather's strength whelp. Tsunade pointed at herself and couldn't help but laugh. You just called me a whelp. Ha, huh, that's a new one. A new one that I'm not really that angry with. It was better than being called old lady or grandma. Or hag. Especially hag, I never thought I'd ever fight anyone else that I could rightfully call an old bag of bones, but here we are. She then punched into her palm with a thick smacking noise, I'd appreciate it if you didn't pick on these kids though. Heh. He Dan said, wiping at his nose, well look at the mama bear. I don't care how strong you are. Your dusty old tits can't take us both on and protect those runts at the same time. I'm killing somebody today. He turned devious eyes towards Shino and Hinata only to have his vision obscured by a green jacket being thrown over his head. Tsuatenkyaku, heavenly foot of pain. And out into the air echoed the sickening crack of someone's neck snapping like a twig and the sound of the ground being pulverized. Tsunade had moved fast enough to hit Hidan unaware with an axe kick that smashed him head first into the ground, a crater forming underneath where he face planted into the grass and dirt. No one moved a muscle. The Kanaha squad didn't move out of shock that a human being could take advantage of a self-created opening with such finality with nothing more than brutal taijutsu. And Kakuzu just didn't seem to care. And that. Tsunade said, grinding her heel into the ground where she'd dropped Hidan in one move is how you do that. Questions? Concerns? She looked up over at Kakuzu who hadn't moved at all since she'd attacked, you should really make sure that if you're going to travel with a human meat shield they're at least moderately reliable as a buffer. She sounded nonchalant, but the fact of the matter was that these jerks were S-ranked, and she wasn't going to sleep on any opportunity to kill them. The fact that a chance to do so presented itself earlier than she'd anticipated was no reason not to break Hidan's neck like a chicken's. Noted. Kakuza said rather cheerfully for his strangely deep voice, I'll bet you can't do it again to me. As a matter of fact I'll stake all of my money that you borrowed off of my banker, and all of the money that I'll get from turning in your corpse, as well as that quaint little necklace of your grandfather that is worth a mint. Your banker. Yes. You borrowed money and didn't pay it back to my banker. My money. His skin seemed to darken as he glared at Tsunade and radiated intense killing intent, oh, and now I'm pissed off again. Go figure. He and Tsunade sped at each other before each broke off and tried to outmaneuver each other, but before Kakuza could make a move on the Sunin, a large swarm of bugs deposited themselves between him and Tsunade, I feel as if you've forgotten us. Shino said as he sent his insects at Kakuzu, that would be a major mistake. The adults are talking. Kakuza replied, casting away his black and red clouded cloak to reveal a black sleeveless shirt underneath. In his back four masks were visibly sewn into his back, one of which separated itself from his body in a mass of black threads that took on the deformed four-legged form of a tiger. All the while, Kakuza created three hand seals, here. Play nice with one of my elemental affinities. Katon, Zokoku. Fire release, intelligent hard work. Deep inside of the black thread body of Kakuzu's fire mask, a small fireball was created that it fired out at Shino's bugs, creating a firestorm that set a vast portion of the open field ablaze. All Kakuzu did was cackle, even while Tsunade glared him down. Damn it Kakuzu. Could you have at least waited until I pulled my head out of that stupid crater you money-grubbing heathen? 
Oh, you're fine. Stop complaining. Tsunade's jaw dropped at hearing Hidan's voice again after what she had done to him. That monster was still alive. No one could have survived something like that. And yet she could see his silhouette standing up as plain as day through the fire, as if she hadn't done what she did to him mere moments earlier. Yes, by the way, about Hidan. Kakuza said, positively grinning beneath his mask, as terrifying as that prospect happened to be the look on the faces of his enemies when they learned of the following information just did it for him every single time, his body is completely unkillable. Omake, Guardian Days 10 Two years and one month after Shikamaru and Naruto's acceptance. A trip into the capital city of Hinokuni near the court of the daimyo was meant to be a day off for two guardians, but it only really ended up being a rest day for one. On duty or not, weird things seemed to happen around them all of the time, even by guardian standards. At least this time the weirdness didn't directly involve Shikamaru. Instead it was solely Naruto's problem today. Sitting off on metal bench just outside of a stand that he and Naruto frequented on their times in the city, Shikamaru just sat off to side eating his mackerel and watching the scene unfolding in front of him with a placid expression on his face. Strange considering his partner was possibly in mortal danger right in front of him. Go away. I don't want to fight today, it's my day off. Stop all of this posturing and fight me properly student of Jiraiya. It's a matter of tradition. It was quite the conundrum that Naruto found himself in. And if ever a situation qualified itself as troublesome this one would have to be it. It had everything that Shikamaru figured to be the hallmark of a bad situation. It involved fighting. It involved effort needing to be given in general. It involved a woman. It involved a woman that apparently knew how to fight and had no problem giving the maximum amount of effort needed. Pretty much everything someone needed to fuck a day up. Responding to a disturbance in the streets, word of which had gotten to the daimyo's court, blind monk Sadeo and giant bucket-helmeted juggernaut Kenta made their appearance along with a platoon of regular soldiers. With a sigh, first and foremost Sadeo walked up to Shikamaru who was still hanging out and watching the proceedings, Okay, why aren't you stopping this shadow boy? Day off. Shikamaru replied before continuing with his meal and ignoring the uproar in the background, besides, She's not stepping in so it's a fair fight. He said, motioning to the Konoichi looking brown haired woman sitting on the exact same bench as him, calmly watching the ongoing fight while drinking tea. She was taller than all of them save for Kenta of course and had short hair, wore a red bodysuit with the back removed from it and a long katana strapped to her back. She didn't seem to want to fight however, so at least she was being civil. The same couldn't be said for what was going on with Naruto. Using his machete he blocked a wave of kunai that had been sent his way by his lovely adversary. He could do that in his sleep, but that didn't make the circumstances surrounding it any less annoying, seriously, I'd be a crappy boyfriend, let alone a husband. I suck. That isn't an option. Naruto's female foe replied, continuing to coat her kunai in wind chakra. She didn't expect that Naruto would have been equally adept at generating elemental chakra through his weaponry, let alone the same element as her, now fight like a man. I won't accept a victory just handed to me. Kenta had walked over behind Sadeo to tower over him while the latter palmed his forehead, what's this all about? This merely showed how he was the most level-headed of the bunch aside from maybe Kenta, but he didn't talk so he didn't count. If it had been Kotoko to respond to the disturbance she probably would have shredded all perpetrators involved and walked away. If it had been Akira she would have probably started taking bets on the fight. If it had been Shinaya he probably would have just sat and watched out of interest for how the fight would turn out. The reason for this being because the two combatants were Naruto and a single girl that they hadn't seen before. A girl Naruto's age with green eyes and black hair and a high and loose ponytail with bangs framing her face. She had on a black headband with the metal plate engraved with a flower insignia. She wore a very tight black outfit with short sleeves and the back exposed with a dark burgundy sash around her waist as well as black sandals. She was doing a very good job of trying to cause Naruto great physical harm. And Sadeo wanted to know why Shikamaru hadn't done anything yet. Day off his ass, there had to be a better reason for it than that. Okay. First of all, the girl's name is Shizuka. And she's the leader of the Nadeshiko village. Shikamaru said, pausing when he heard Sadeo let out a whistle, either at her looks or at the title. 
Probably the latter because he really couldn't see her, yeah. She's 14 like us. Naruto pissing someone off wasn't that strange, but he was usually good about keeping himself under control around dignitaries. And why was she even there to begin with? Nade's Hiko village was kind of way out of the way. Like, south of Mizu no Kuni out of the way, that still doesn't explain why this is happening. Getting to that. Shikamaru replied, thinking of a way to begin explaining what was happening, so you know how Naruto's sensei Jiraiya was hanging around and looking all skittish all week long before he just up and left yesterday. Both Sadeo and Kenta wordlessly nodded, well we know why he left so fast now. It had been weird. Jiraiya seemed to be jumping at shadows. At first everyone figured that he'd just pissed Tsunade off and had been ducking her, but that wasn't the case as even she didn't know what the deal was. He'd been off of his game every time he sparred with Naruto and absent-minded. Then he up and left. Shikamaru continued his narration of the current events, a bunch of years ago way before any of us were born Jiraiya wound up infiltrating Nade's Hiko village to do his perv thing, and on his way out after he got busted he got into a fight and fought with her dash dot. Shikamaru stressed, pointing at the girl hurling weaponry at Naruto, sensei, the old leader of their village. Their village has a law where guys who defeat their women are supposed to be engaged to them, and you can guess how that went over with him. So he didn't beat her because he knew what would happen. He just promised that he'd have the woman's student fight with his student and pick up where they left off. So. Sadeo tried to pick up what Shikamaru was laying down, what, did he think that wasn't ever going to happen or anything? He had to admit from what he was seeing as Naruto deflected a powerful stream of wind from Shizuka that he could have dodged that he was doing a good job of minimizing property damage. Clearly. Shikamaru said as he then watched Naruto dodge a falling kick that had wind chakra around the leg. Naruto was definitely not going to stand beneath that and try to block it. He knew better, as it destroyed a large portion of the road upon contact, he didn't want any students back then. How'd he figure he'd end up with Naruto, or even the Yondai Me? Nami Kaze Minato hadn't even graduated the academy back then. Oh. Well that sucks. From the sound of his voice, Sadeo didn't really care that much. But he kind of did. Not because he didn't want Naruto to get hitched, because he didn't give a damn about that. No, he cared because Naruto was under contract, and if that contract was broken just so this little princess could take Naruto as her hubby, there was a good chance that such a thing could either get Naruto assassinated or start a war. Neither of those things were good and needed to be avoided if at all possible. You don't even know. Shikamaru said with a shake of his head, Naruto has two options as far as I can see. First of all he can just kick her ass and wind up with her trying to take him back to her village to marry him. Entirely possible, because while Shizuka was good befitting of her status, and had mastery of her wind techniques to a great degree, Naruto was better. He'd mastered his element as well, and he was making it hard on her just by dodging everything she was throwing at him. She hadn't touched him in 20 minutes. Winning would be bad though, since he wouldn't kill her in victory just for trying to follow her village's customs she would try to take him with her. And who knew how bad that could wind up being, or how long it could take to settle. Kunoichi were crazy and sometimes very vindictive. Kotoko, Akira, and Tsunade were all living proof of that. Or he can stand there and let her flatten and possibly kill him so that she'll leave him alone. Holding his hands up like two sides of a balance beam he continued, that's a lesser evil though. Logic would say to just throw the fight since he can take a bit of a beat down because of the QB and because we're here and won't let her kill him dash dot. But this is Naruto we're talking about here. Sadeo concluded, rubbing his eyes beneath his sunglasses, the guy that would rather flip the shogi board than lose a game. A game that he knows he's garbage at. I can't imagine how he'd feel about losing a fight he knows he can win hands down. Kenta tapped the smaller monk on the shoulder and somehow Sadeo understood what he was trying to say, yeah, this girl seems to hate Naruto, so what would she actually get out of getting with him? It is the custom of our village for the women to marry men stronger than them to ensure powerful offspring. The woman next to Shikamaru, probably Shizuka's attendant, said as she continued to neutrally sit and watch, as its leader Shizuka-sama more than anyone else doesn't have the luxury of casting such a thing aside. I wouldn't say she hates him either. He just hasn't tried to hit her back from the start. She thinks he's being sexist. No, 
he's not being sexist. That's my thing. Shikamaru amended for her, he just doesn't know if he wants to fight to win or not. Win and be engaged to some girl he doesn't know, or lose. You'd think that decision would be easy wouldn't you? Naruto's pride was perhaps his greatest strength and weakness. He had an unflappable self-confidence in himself to the point where every time he fought with Jiraiya he always believed he'd find some way to pull out the win, and as a guardian you had to walk around believing that you could handle absolutely any task the daimyo or Nobuyuki decided to throw at you on any given day. On the other hand there were also extreme negatives to that. Such as not willing to let anyone believe that they could beat your ass, no matter how much trouble actually winning the fight would be for him. You could actually see it on his face. He knew exactly what was going on and the ramifications of either victory or defeat. He also knew that the outcome of either was all in his hands. He was fighting with himself over whether or not to let Shizuka just lay him out with one of those shots and pick his ego up off of the ground later, or to actually try to win and open up a whole new kin of worms. Oh. What if he scared her off? That could work. Whether she was trying to marry him for customary reasons or not she probably wouldn't want her name to be associated with monsters or anything like that. Girls kind of had a thing for their significant others not being freaks or what have you. And he had one in his belly. All of a sudden Naruto stopped and his entire body was covered in a red, fox-shaped shroud of chakra complete with two tails as his features roughened, oops. Naruto said in a deadpan voice, oh, would you look at that? My biju is showing. Sorry about that. From the complete look of shock and astonishment on Shizuka's face he felt that his spur of the moment gambit had worked. It had worked well enough that he didn't have to go ahead and flatten her to win the battle at least, which was what he wanted. Nearby, Shikamaru looked on and nodded in silent approval. He couldn't have picked a lazier way to stop a fight himself, short of just giving up of course. But since Naruto never surrendered this was as shrewd a move as he could have made. Especially when he immediately took his opening to hightail it on out of their back to the court, with Shikamaru finding it prudent to follow. He'd finished his lunch after all. Let it be known that Izumaki Naruto did not run away, he strategically retreated. He was also going to strategically avoid that woman for as long as possible to avoid another no-win scenario if this didn't get rid of her for good. He was also going to strategically kick Jiraiya and his scrotum when he saw him again for leaving him to this with little to no warning. And once Naruto was gone, both Sadeo and Kenta found no reason to hang around, as one of the causes of the in-town disturbance had just left. It would probably be quite some time before Naruto returned to the city after this little episode. The functional mute Kenta nudged the smaller Sadeo with his elbow, getting a nod from the blind young man who spoke for him, You're right Kenta, there's no more issue here. You guys enjoy the rest of your stay in the capital, stay out of trouble, and have a safe trip home. Even when the last two guardians on the scene departed, the leader of the Nadeshiko village couldn't help but stare at the place that Naruto had been standing at minutes ago. As her female attendant came up to her to get her attention she still didn't look away. Takiwa. Shizuka said after having recovered enough to speak, he referred to the biju, which would make him a dash dot. Jinchuriki. Takiwa said, finishing her sentence for her, yes, exactly. To think that Jiraiya would have trained one of them as his own student. She trailed off in thought at the prospect of a biju container being the student of one of the most powerful men to ever come from Kanaha. All Shizuka did was continue to stare, can I defeat him? He'd kept her at bay the entire time without using a single offensive attack and looked more annoyed than threatened by anything that she did, or am I just putting off my own responsibility? The battle technically never ended. Shizuka never struck Naruto nor did he strike her with anything on his end so there was no real victory. Either way, she wasn't leaving yet until she got a definite fight out of Naruto that would end one way or the other. And if she lost she would then not be giving up on someone so definitively stronger than her, no matter how long it took. After Chapter 55, Pick Up or Delivery In the mansion of the Hokage, Hiruzen was getting a late-night bi-weekly briefing from Yamato as to the current progression of the manhunt for their pesky little spy. It had been nearly a week since the entire operation had begun, and working a domestic procedure like this never left good feelings. But it was necessary. Security of the village was paramount, and no amount of scrutiny was too much in order to bring espionage to light. 
Yamato had no real news for his Hokage though, much to the chagrin of the former. The only run-in worth mentioning with any of the groups I have under my command happens to be the one that occurred with the team led by Might Guy. Yamato reported in the moonlight of the window while heroes and read documents by lamp in a comfortable lounge chair, they discovered the entrance to a root tunnel on the grounds of the former Uchiha district, but backed off of investigating it. If they had done so they would have instigated a confrontation. Hiruzen let out a sigh at that. Of course he knew that Danzo had not fully disbanded Root the way he had commanded almost a decade ago, but they were a formidable force and Danzo's way of doing things had many supporters in the village. Directly forcing him could result in civil war or some sort of social upheaval. The man was no fool and would know how to play the cards presented to him. Still, the audacity to set up a secret tunnel on the lands of the clan that he had indirectly orchestrated the extermination of. Let the dead lie still for goodness sake. Yamato. Hiruzen said, getting his subordinate's attention, I want every ninja over the rank of Chunin prepared for anything in the coming days. I'll be informing Shikaku in the morning to put the watch teams on invasion alert but with their focus pointed inward. Make sure they all know to remember to keep this quiet from the genin being taught in squads. Of course. For genin things were need to know. For something like this they most certainly did not need to know anything. They would be more likely to get in the way and get themselves hurt or killed than help out. I can get word to the teams watching the limits of the village to do this already before I retire for the night. Yamato offered, getting a grateful smile from Hiruzen in return, do you need anything else from me Hokage-sama? Only the continued current effort that you are giving your assignment. The wizened old man said before Yamato seemed to just about disappear from his mansion office. Between the spy seemingly reporting on every major move Kanaha had tried to make for the last three years plus and Danzo trying to undermine him from the shadows there was no shortage of trouble on the home front for him to juggle. It was a welcome comfort that he had such a loyal force of ninjas that would work for Kanaha. Elsewhere in Kanaha, Ninja Academy, Administrative Division. The halls of the academy were vacant at such a late time of the night, all with the exception of one elderly man covered in bandages and holding a cane. Walking into one of the great meeting halls for the real higher UPS of the village, Danzo went inside and stopped once he reached the middle of the room. He didn't even bother turning around to face the person he knew was there at the door. Yes Jiraiya? Is there any reason you're interrupting my quiet reflection time? Indeed, standing at the open double doors was Jiraiya with a very serious expression on his face. His first instinct was to make a joke about Danzo's quiet reflection time, but now was not the time or the place. What the hell do you think you've been doing for all of these years? He asked with a barely restrained tone, building secret paths on private property in the village? Maintaining your own standing private army? What's the point? I am the one willing to do what Hiruzen is not to keep this village safe and strong. Danzo said, not raising his voice or rising to the fact that Jiraiya had cornered him for this discussion, every great tree needs its roots after all. Safe and strong. Jiraiya replied, how is outright undermining the Hokage doing anything other than making us all weaker? You're supposed to be an advisor. And that's what I've always done. Danzo said, turning around with his single eye narrowed on Jiraiya's form, I've tried to advise him for years. But in all of that time he's only heeded my advice on what course of action to take once. Just once. And if he hadn't taken my direction this village would have seen a civil war. But I wouldn't expect you to know about it with you being out and about, wasting years pursuing your traitorous teammate. Jiraiya's fist shot out and punched the door frame hard enough to break it and bust a metal hinge on the door leaving it leaning, and I'd do it again. You think I wanted to do what I did? I have a godson here. But that same teammate is holding a blade over this village's head as we speak. He gestured out of the door through the windows lining the wall of the hallway outside, I don't know if you've noticed, but this piece that we've spent the last ten years trying to savor is slowly routing away like tooth enamel. You call it peace? Danzo seemed to wish to spit at the thought of considering Kanaha currently safe, what I see are enemies at the gate, and enemies amongst us. And as all of this is happening I feel that I am the only man fighting the tide. You've been out there. You've seen it firsthand. But you clearly choose to ignore all of it. And you want to go to war with all of it. Jiraiya you know full well the only path to actual peace. Danzo continued to try and reason, 
even a man with all the power needed to achieve anything, such as Senju Hashirama, tried things your way when he had enough power to keep and hand the biju over to the other villages. Had he merely finished things with the upstart villages of the past, there would be no four other great villages. We really would all be one. And that's why as long as I'm around I can never let you be Hokage. Jiraiya said with a shake of his head, you would start a war with everyone in the elemental nations just to put yourself at the top, because you think you have all of the answers. Hmm. <laughs> Danzo said, walking past Jiraiya to leave the room, not even finding himself wary of giving Jiraiya his open back, at least I'm the one trying to come up with an answer based in reality. Instead of you, waiting on the child of prophecy, as you called it? How did that wind up working out? The very last thing Jiraiya needed to be reminded of in life was the results of his past adhering to the prophecy of the most elder of his summoned creatures. Two students of his fell prey to what he'd been told decades ago, and that just so happened to be his button of sorts. Because he reached out and grabbed Danzo by the throat from behind and squeezed liberally to strangle the old man. You've got the balls to say something like that about a man that saved this village in your worthless life at the cost of his own, of his wife's, and of their own child's freedom. Jiraiya said, refraining from lifting Danzo up. The only indication that Danzo was even choking was the strained sound of breath leaving him. His face didn't change, and his body didn't move to free himself, you can start and win a thousand wars, and you won't be half the hero that Minato was. With that, Jiraiya let go of his neck and walked past him first before the old man could black out, and Danzo took in deep breaths of air to keep himself on his feet as his rival's top loyal student left the room stopping at the door that he'd originally broken to look back at him with a massive grin on his face. See, that's why I can't be Hokage. Jiraiya said, tone belying the bloodlust that was fully radiating from him even at that very moment, you see, Sensei wouldn't have tried to strangle you. He wouldn't have thought of trying to snap your brittle neck like a twig. He let out a laugh without an ounce of humor in it, the only thing that kept me from doing it right here, right now was thinking of what that would do to Sensei himself. Now was not the time for people to get the idea that Hiruzen had sent Jiraiya to take out his chief competition for continued seed of Hokage under the guise of the spy mess, which was what it would be construed to look like once the inevitable details of Jiraiya killing him leaked out. He wouldn't be surprised if Danzo had people watching over him just for that very reason. He actually was surprised that they didn't attack him when he'd gotten a hold of his neck. Danzo just glared at Jiraiya through his single visible eye before the man left to exit the building altogether. He could still feel Jiraiya's grip around his neck, but he knew that the fool wouldn't kill him. He was too deeply seated into Kanaha's hierarchy to go missing. His death at a time like this would basically martyr him in regards to the message of how endangered Kanaha was without his policies being featured. I will do what is right for this village whether Hiruzen and his lapdog of a student are against my methods or not. Speaking of his policies, the patterns that the spy happened to be using to cover his tracks seemed, somewhat familiar. But that wasn't possible. Clearing his own throat, Danzo proceeded to leave the room to return to his own home for the evening. There was work to be done to catch this spy and apparently he was the only one in Kanaha with the fortitude to get the job done at all costs. The clandestine leader of Root left the halls of the administrative building, and his hidden shadows followed him, keeping a watchful eye on their leader, but as they left the vacant corridors they missed the shine of the moonlight off of a remaining figure's circular glasses as his body slipped up from underneath the floor, a confident smile on his face, nice to see you again Danzo. We'll have to catch up again some other time. Right now he had to put the finishing touches on his grand old exfiltration of Kanahagakur. For good this time. You created this monster Danzo. Countryside of Hino Kuni, forests around the outskirts of Okumizu Mimaki. So Tamari had to face the gigantic Akimichi kid and the genjutsu adept pink-haired girl that had made her and Kankura look stupid one time each. That was fine with her. The fact of the matter remained, no matter how big you are, you can still be cut by my jutsu. Dekame Tachi no jutsu, great sickle weasel jutsu. With a swing of her fan, she manipulated the latent currents in the air to a razor-sharp degree and sent them the way of Chuji to fell him like a tree. Sakura gasped and jumped off of Chuji's shoulder as he shrunk in size to make himself more difficult to hit with the killer wind technique. It kept him from being shredded like newspaper for the time being if nothing else. Landing in a roll, 
The pink-haired Kunoichi of Team 7 hurled a pair of kunai with little bags attached it to Mary only for her to blow them away as if it were child's play. Of course that wouldn't have worked, but she had to test how attentive she was nonetheless, tisk. Sure, if she had half a memory she'd remember how Sakura won a battle years ago with a special genjutsu that required a visual medium as a trigger. This was a more practical idea based around that one to sucker her into one of her most painful illusions. It was her favorite finish, but it wasn't to be on this occasion. You couldn't have possibly thought that something like that would work. Tamari said, directing her attention Sakura's way with a smirk. As this occurred, the sound of clicking and chattering could steadily be heard getting closer until Karasu launched itself from the forest at Sakura again, took you long enough Kankuro. The Suna puppeteer was not in the mood for any snippy remarks from his older sister at the moment as he threw his voice from wherever he was hiding, I got covered in human piss by that goddamn Inuzuka kid. Well he left, so help me deal with these ones and maybe we can catch up to him or follow him back to the rest of the Kanaha ninjas. Tamari insisted, preparing to heft her fan for another grand swing, Gara should be done with their teammate any second now. Right. Definitely don't want to keep him waiting, even if he is more patient. Sakura and Chuji moved nearer to each other again, keeping an eye on Tamari and Kankuro's puppet while trying to find where the man himself was, my bags on the kunai didn't break. She expected Tamari's attack to cut them open, which would have set her up for a rather devastating jutsu, but she completely turned off the cutting power of her wind jutsu, too straightforward. The pink-haired Kunoichi asked rhetorically. I think she's just really attentive. Chuji said instead of outright agreeing, long-range fighters usually are which meant that Sakura was going to have a harder time sinking in a genjutsu since both Tamari and Kankuro knew what she was capable of. That severely limited their options since Chuji was strictly close range in his abilities, and Tamari was not about to let them get close enough to make that work. Chuji. Sakura said, mind turning quickly to try and come up with a solution. It wasn't a complicated look underneath the underneath Shikamaru special, but it was something she had plenty of faith in to request. Use the multi-size jutsu again for me and dash. She trailed off to quietly whisper the rest of her idea to him. It was good enough to get his eyes to go wide and get a firm nod from him that this was the move to make. Baika no jutsu, multi-size jutsu. Once again, Chuji's mass expanded to that of a giant, though still smaller than the first time he made use of the jutsu in the ongoing battle, completely demanding attention as his body grew to unreal proportions. To Mary, however, was not impressed, this again. I can still cut you up from here no matter how big you are, and none of that will stop Kankuro from poisoning you. She was about to show this first hand with her next move until something terrifying happened. She saw Chuji grin evilly and place his hands together in the form of a hand seal that she knew from doing battle with the most prolific user of the jutsu it was affiliated with in the past. Chuji's hands were stuck in the position for calling upon the Kage Bunshin technique. And right before her eyes, seven chujis, all as tall as trees with four times the girth surrounded the clearing, all glaring inward at her and Karasu. Did everyone in Kanaha know how to use that goddamn technique like that? As far as she knew from the fact that her village had a few people that could use the jutsu as well, even making one was extremely dangerous due to it carving up your chakra evenly between each clone, but here were six clones, splitting the Akimichi kid's chakra seven ways. Kankuro Tamari shouted as she saw all of the Chijis lift their glowing blue hands with strange markings on them. She couldn't target them all, she couldn't do anything about the ones at her backside, and she couldn't dodge what that would do to the ground around her even if she could avoid the crushing palms themselves. Got it, just hold on. Kankuro cried out, willing her to simply wait on him while he did something. Even if she couldn't attack them all, he could, Kurohiji, Rakasora, Black Secret Technique falling skies. The sound of something large being launched into the air gave way to a very large container of some sort flying up into the night sky. Once it reached a high enough altitude, it exploded. Tamari immediately swung her fan upward, because she knew what was happening and that she had to protect herself. If she hadn't right when the pod exploded, she would have been impaled by a spike half her size in less than a second. The entire open area of the battlefield was covered in the large spikes impaling into the ground, the trees, it was all a gigantic clearing of spikes littering the area. The only clear place was around Tamari, 
since she had protected herself with powerful winds to keep the spikes from killing her. The thing about it was though, that there were no dead chijis around either. There hadn't been any puffs of smoke, nor was there a gigantic, dead, original anywhere around her. What the hell? Those big, fat, slow bastards couldn't dodge that. Once that pod exploded it was instantaneous. The only reason she was able to do anything about it when she did was because she knew what was coming and how fast she needed to be to save herself. And then it hit her. Little pink-haired genjutsu bitch. The only saving grace to being caught hook, line, and sinker in the trap was that genjutsu affected the brain, which thought and worked much quicker than things happened on the outside. Cancellation of the genjutsu revealed that while it was around 12 seconds while subjected to the illusion, it had been closer to 3 seconds in real time. 3 seconds where she couldn't notice or react to anything that her enemies were doing. And if it took her that much time to break it herself, how long was it taking Kankuro? The reason being, that he really needed to make sure that it had been broken by now. Nakudenhari Sensha, Spiked Human Bullet Tank A gigantic Rolling ball comprised of Chuji's body covered in his own overgrown, spiky hair tore through the stumps and spikes littering the area before he barreled straight into the forest in the direction he saw Kankuro shoot his jutsu off into the air from. Trees were not an obstacle for this sphere of devastation. He rolled over any tree fool enough to not sprout legs and run away, and cut the trunks to pulp underneath his hair that served as deadly, deadly treads for his locomotion. Kankuro. Tamari shouted at her brother hoping that her voice could break through what influenced Sakura's genjutsu might or might not have had hold on him. Speaking of which, a sharp movement from near her blind spot caught Tamari's attention and she turned, opening her iron fan to block the stab of a kunai that was directed right at her liver, how did you do that? I can't give away all of my tricks, even to an ally of Suna. Sakura said as Tamari pulled her fan up. She jumped back enough to set up for another move, but she wasn't going to let her swing that fan to cause any wind to fly if it killed her, I might not be the best at taijutsu, but if she has to carry that big thing she's got to be centered around backing off and using it from a distance. It was difficult to deal with though. Fully open, Tamari's fan easily kept her entire body out of Sakura's view. She wasn't going to be stabbing anyone behind that thing. And Tamari could always move it right in front of her dexterously to keep her at bay. If only it was Chuji taking her on up close instead, he'd have just slapped her aside and been done with it. Sakura wasn't that strong. She didn't have any ninjutsu in her repertoire that could bolster her close range capabilities either. Tamari chortled at Sakura's failed attempts to harm her, you think I'd carry something this big if I didn't know how to handle it in a situation like this. Without warning she closed the fan and in one motion proceeded to swing it like a bat at the unprepared Sakura who barely covered up to defend from being struck, grow up. Sakura's body slammed off of one of the tree trunks that Tamari had previously cut down, losing the kunai that bounced out of her grip and away upon impact. She cringed and held the back of her head where it hit, steadying her vision on the fan-wielding maiden of the desert, damn it. I've been doing nothing but keeping her on her heels all fight long and I can't secure anything to win with. It wasn't fair. She'd been doing everything right. She'd had her in dire straits twice, but the fact was that she had to get up close to beat Tamari, and in close she didn't have anything that would do the trick for certain. Tamari could use her fan for wind ninjutsu, to protect her entire body, and as a bludgeoning tool. What was she to do if she couldn't win at far range and wasn't good enough and tight to do anything decisive? Don't you get it? Tamari said, you're not fighting an opponent with some clear as day fatal flaw to their style. Any ninja worth a damn already knows what they're weak at, but they've fixed it enough avoid it being a problem. So unless you're a taijutsu adept, you're not laying a hand on me sister. The village of Kanahagakur ninja always had it so easy from her point of view, in every way. Their climate and geography? The most hospitable in all of the nations. Their standards for a shinobi, even genin? In her opinion they were far more lax than Sunagakur's when it came to that. Even the men and women that were supposed to be noted as skilled always seemed to be soft to her. Why were they the best and perceived as the strongest? Why did Suna have to play second banana to them in their treaty? She didn't understand and she didn't want to. Suna was doing better under the treaty once the idiotic previous wind daimyo had been ousted and replaced by their current one and at the behest of the fire daimyo he began supporting and funding the village system better, 
but even so, they were still seen as inferior to Kanaha. You think I don't know that you condescending skank? Sakura said bitingly as she got back to her feet, it's clear that you're still seeing me and all of our friends the way you probably did when you met us in the Chunin exams years ago. But tell me, back then would you have had nearly as much trouble with me as you're having now? The answer was a resounding no. Sakura had some neat little tricks back then to get over with, but by and large Tamari would have squashed her in short order and they both knew it. She wanted to say that the danger aspect of Chuji was the reason that she'd lasted so long, but in reality Sakura had been the one keeping her reeling, not the big boned Akimichi. It's funny how you disrespect us and think we're weak because we're from Kanaha but you want Tsunade Sama. You saw Naruto and Ino and Shikamaru like that back then too when you fought them in the finals. Sakura said with a smirk, then what happened? Okame Tachi, Scythe Weasel. Tamari did not need to be reminded of the last battle that she and her siblings ever wound up losing and prepared a win that would turn Sakura's pretty little body into a set of bloody slabs. Nakuden Hari Sensha, Spiked Human Bullet Tank. Chuji flew through the air from where he'd been steamrolling through the forest looking for Kankuro and hurled himself right at Tamari, forcing her to divert her winds his way to stop him from annihilating her. The steel-like consistency of the hair that covered his body kept him from getting hurt, but he lost his momentum and plummeted to the ground with a crash. Tamari smirked until she saw a handful of kunai thrown up into the path of her windstorm. Okay, so that happened, what the hell was that supposed to accomplish? Tamari shouted over at Sakura who wisely hadn't tried getting close to her otherwise she would have failed in that task. Sakura didn't say anything and just stood up as tiny cherry blossoms floated all over to surround Tamari from the air. Those kunai, were those the same ones with the bags attached? Tamari immediately placed her hands in the ram seal to break the forthcoming genjutsu that she was certain was going to come her way. She remembered seeing Sakura's coup de grace back in the Chunin exams when she defeated that Oto Gen in Kin and she was not about to let herself get caught in it. That seemed to be what Sakura was waiting on as she quickly threw a kunai with an explosive tag burning down at Tamari's feet. To avoid being hit, Tamari lowered the hand seal and leapt away with her fan, heh. This one's not a genjutsu like the first set would have been. Dread filled the pit of Tamari's stomach in that instant, what? Sakura Fubuki no jutsu, cherry blossom blizzard jutsu. The kunai detonated a distance away from Tamari but all of the petals that had been floating all over weren't just petals. Most of them were miniature explosive tags painstakingly designed by the resident seal adept of the Rookie 9 for use as a secondary trap jutsu. They all exploded all around Tamari in a chain reaction, and she didn't react fast enough to blow them all away after the first explosion ripped free out. She was at the mercy of blast after blast until it all subsided, leaving the area a smoky, charred mess. Wow. Chuji said as he walked over to Sakura after it seemed to be all over, that cheap ass, Ryo store jutsu actually worked. Cheap jutsu. Sakura squeaked before punching Chuji in his arm hard, what made it cheap? The fact I didn't make it come out of thin air or shoot it from my mouth. Oh I know, I didn't change my entire bodily makeup to pull it off, that's what's wrong. Chuji wanted to cover his ears, but he had to suffer through it for the time being. He should have known better really. How long had they been a team? He'd opened that can of worms when he'd made that crack at her jutsu and now he had to live with it. He ran over Kankuro's puppet Sanshao when he'd been dozing through the forest. He didn't break it, but it didn't move again and it was buried halfway into the ground when he saw it so he was out cold. Chuji had already tied him up. Now they just had to find Tamari. In the meantime he had to listen to Sakura, uh huh. No really. Do you know how hard it is to learn a strong ninjutsu when you're not clan-based? I had to get advice on that one from Tenten. Sakura continued to complain as she and Chuji began checking over the area for Tamari, I specialize in genjutsu for a reason you know. The rest of you have the weirdest techniques that I could never match up with, except with my own imagination. Hopefully they would be able to find Tamari before the sun came up, because he needed the change in subject. Sasuke vs. Gara. It was taking everything Sasuke had to keep away from Gara's sand. His efforts went solely into keeping himself one step ahead, and even then it sometimes wasn't enough. He had to remove a limb more than once from the seemingly inescapable trap that was constantly being hurled his way by the expressionless Sunanin. 
he couldn't rely too heavily on his impeccable eyesight alone to do the job for him. That simply wasn't going to work. Why didn't his clan ever invest in protective eyewear? It kind of seemed like a no-brainer now that he was facing this current problem. That probably should have been the first thing they did. The constant grains of sand floating in the air were Sasuke's saving grace and his primary detriment at the same time. It was in the air to keep him from outright relying on his sherry non to anticipate every path of motion that Gara's sweeping waves of sand would take every step of the way. While it didn't cost Gara much of his personal sand to do this, it cost him part of his focus. Keeping part of his attention on maintaining that irritant kept Gara from concentrating fully on putting forth the effort to attack Sasuke at all costs. His sand is so much faster than it was back then. Sasuke had never faced it personally until this point, but he'd seen it active in battle and just as he had grown in physical speed the sand had as well. He got a really good view of it when it chose to slam bluntly into him. Who knew that getting hit with sand would hurt so much? You're sweating and bleeding. Gara remarked coldly. Sasuke could have sworn that he hadn't moved a step since he'd taken control of the battle, I'm still waiting on the tears and pleads for mercy. You're going to be waiting for a while then. Sasuke replied, wishing he had Naruto's wind ninjutsu to blow the stupid sand grains away so he could stop squinting and blinking involuntarily, what would Itachi do? He thought to himself, begrudging himself for even asking himself that question as he kept backflipping out of the way of Gara's sand. The thought had merit, whether he liked it or not. Lightning techniques could pierce the shield of sand, though it would have to be one that was actually strong enough to do the job all the way through. Fire might be able to cook him on the inside of the shield, but the sand would just snuff it out unless he kept up the flame for long enough to pull it off, which wasn't going to happen. Option number one it was then. Well, actually there was always option number three. Sasuke took some blood from a patch of his arms that Gara had scraped the skin off of with his sandy attack and bolted through hand seals instantly before slamming his hand on the ground, Kuchi Yase no Jutsu, summoning Jutsu. A non-existent eyebrow of Gara's rose in interest at the sight of a gigantic hawk taking flight in the air above from the smoke that had risen from the summoning. Sasuke stood on its back with a confident smirk, let's see just what that sand of yours can really take. I fail to see what this is going to accomplish. Gara deadpanned honestly. Sure, Sasuke's hawk was big enough to ride, and those talons were pretty imposing, as was the beak, but it didn't matter, just what do you think you can do with it? Don't underestimate a ninja's summons. Sasuke said, rolling through more hand seals before inhaling deeply, Katon, Gukaku no Jutsu, Fire Release, Great Fireball Jutsu. Normally a fireball from Sasuke would be dangerous enough by itself, but the moment he fired it his hawk began flapping its wings and kicking up a windstorm to push it forward and spread it out dangerously. It created a barely controlled firestorm that covered Gara on all sides, but for as incredible a sight as it was it didn't cause him any harm other than making him sweat a bit from the sheer heat. Was he trying to cook him inside of a makeshift earthen oven of sand? That was just too much. And the damnable thing about it all was that it was working. Gara's own choice to limit his mobility in battle was coming back to bite him here and now as the temperature rose rapidly to a frightening degree. As if he hadn't been using enough sand before, Gara sent out more than Sasuke thought he had to begin with, whipping it all around and stanching the flames quicker than they would have spread in the first place before sending it Sasuke's way in large, grabby tendrils. Gara learned from his battle with Naruto that while giving in to the Shukaku made him stronger, he sacrificed control and much of the things that made him formidable to begin with. Losing to Naruto showed him that the trade-off wasn't worth it and completely abandoned using his tiny Shukaku form, learning to do some of the techniques himself without tapping into too much Biju Chakra to lose himself. With a series of hand seals the sand morphed itself into a head of Shukaku that sucked in wind hard enough to steal the oxygen from the rest of the flames in the area, giving off a whistling, hissing sound as a pressurized ball of air formed at the mouth of the construct. Futon, Rikudan, Wind Release, Drilling Air Bullet. Sasuke saw it coming and his hawk was skilled enough to avoid it when it shot at them in the air, if that had hit they'd be finding pieces of my summon falling from the sky in the nearest town. Maybe pieces of me too. It wasn't over though. Gara needed more chakra through his sand that began to gather at the Shukaku mouth for another compressed air bullet and began shooting them off, one after another with only enough lag time in between them to build up more for a new shot. 
Going with Hawks as his summon creatures might have been the best thing Sasuke could have done given the current situation. He could see how much force those large balls of wind had within them. If they made contact with anything, whatever they hit just wasn't going to exist in the same state any longer. Sasuke's hawk swooped low enough for one of Gara's missed shots to wind up in the vicinity of the nearby woods. The moment it touched the first trees in its way it exploded and leveled 30 yards worth of forest in the process. Right. New plan. Getting his hawk to go around for another pass, Sasuke dropped down in a position on his animal rides back to prepare for a speedy rush while forming a chidori in his hand. The chidori seemed to extend in length to around 15 feet, chidori iso, Chidori Sharp Spear. It was weaker in puncturing power than the real Chidori despite its extended range, but from where he was attacking from it would have to do. From a bit of a distance, the hawk started coming in quickly, with the glowing electric blade stretching from Sasuke's right hand leading the way in front of its head. What was this, a joust? Yeah, it was. Only instead of a horse, Sasuke had a goddamned hawk, and instead of a lance he had a blade of pure electric chakra. A screaming hawk flying right at them faster than most high-level ninjas could even move would have scared the hell out of most people, but Gara was not most people. Gara's sand formed a thick half-dome right in front of his body as Sasuke jumped off of his hawk to allow it to safely bail out without sacrificing itself for the sake of the attack. The carried-on speed that went along with it propelled him straight into the wall and with several almost unseeable flicks of his wrist he cut a hole straight through the sand and barreled straight into Gara, whom he stabbed clean through. Holding his Chidori hand out while crouched and sliding to a hard stop, Sasuke's Jutsu pushed Gara up into the end on the end of the electric blade where it then branched while still in his body, stabbing out of him in five different directions. It then proceeded to crumble into sand, revealing to be a sand clone. I have to apologize. Gara commented, having substituted himself with a sand clone once he realized that the velocity of the previous move was more than definitely going to best his shield of sand. I said that you could never break through my sand. I see more drastic measures will need to be taken to deal with you. Crap. Sasuke thought as he turned Gara's way and saw a horrifying amount of sand pouring out of the ground like water from a geyser. It just kept coming, you can make more. When had he put together the time to even do such a thing? Of course. When he'd been firing off shots with the Shukaku's head, Sasuke had been flying around to avoid them for over a minute. But was that really enough time to loosen up the soil enough to make that much sand? Good lord. There wasn't any way around that. I can make so much more. As much as I need. Gara said as he stood elevated off of the ground by a sand platform while he started manipulating the rest underneath him Sasuke's way with multiple hand seals that started and ended with him clapping his hands, I am known as Sabaku no Gara and Sunagakur. Gara of the Sand Waterfall. Ryusa Bakuriwa. Quicksand waterfall flow. And with that, Gara sent every bit of it forward. Sasuke was not going to avoid anything like this. There was no way. Even looking at him from where he was standing, Gara knew as much. He did his best to run, but it caught up to him and engulfed him entirely, covering over him and burying him entirely. Now die for me. Sabaku Taiso, Sand Waterfall Imperial Funeral. Dropping down from his platform, Gara slammed his hands onto the ground and let out a shockwave that sent ripples all throughout the sand-covered battlefield. And that was that. So why did he hear the faint chirping of birds? And why couldn't he feel a body down there as his sifted through his sand to confirm his kill? Kai. Gara threw his hands into a seal to disrupt his own flow of chakra and found that the sound wasn't faint, it was loud and clear. Turning around he saw Sasuke standing there charging up a Chidori before streaking his way the moment he turned, how? Eye contact. Sasuke shouted, alluding to a Sherry non-genjutsu as he dashed at Gara with his arm poised to strike out at him, now die for me. Chidori, 1000 birds. Gara couldn't home his sand in on Sasuke's footing enough to stop him with a wall, even on the now sandy field they stood on. He was too fleet-footed, too quick and he had the jump on him thoroughly. There wasn't going to be any slight deterrence like some sand in the eye to deter this strike. Well sometimes one did have to take their own defense into their own hands after all. You couldn't always rely on the basic stuff to get the job done. Just in front of Gara, a tall and wide replica wall of Shukaku formed, 
complete with markings on the body from the sand that he had created just as Sasuke's hand shot forward to finish him off. Even with the Chidori surrounding it, Sasuke's hand did not pierce the gigantic solid shield. It actually broke his hand from the force that he hit it with. Recoiling promptly with a visible cringe that belied just how much breaking all of the little bones in his hand had hurt him, Sasuke backflipped away. Do you now see that, absolute defense, isn't just a catchy title for my jutsu? Gara said as he saw Sasuke cradling his Chidori hand, the hardest minerals that I could find went into that shield. And now you can no longer make hand seals. Sasuke winced and left his injury alone. Yeah, his fingers weren't going to be making seals for a while. Even so. Can that thing move? What does it matter when you're right in front of me? If you go around you will be going to your death either way. P.R. From behind in the air, a massive brown blur plowed into Gara with one pulverizing, 200 plus mile per hour dive bomb, shooting sand high into the air and then a large puff of smoke. True to Gara's word, his Shikaku shield really was made of the best stuff, because it didn't budge. That was bad for Gara though because he'd just been hit with a gigantic summon hawk's full speed dive from high altitude, and if Sasuke was right about the trajectory it had taken, Gara wound up being sandwiched between hundreds of pounds of hawk and that damn shield he'd put up. Granted, that was not exactly what the hawks were meant for since it probably nearly killed it before it sent itself back to from whence it came, but it wasn't his idea to begin with and it seemed to work out for the best. Just in case though, Sasuke quickly vacated the bit of land that was completely covered in sand. He didn't need any, beyond the grave, surprises, even though he was sure that someone like Gara wasn't used to being hurt, and what had just occurred would have had to have been punishing. As long as he didn't do that full biju thing that people said he did in the Chunin exams after Naruto defeated him, things would be fine. Still though, he could hear Gara breathing raggedly and had to hold back from cursing when he saw him walk out from behind his shield. How are you not dead after that? Sasuke asked, not bothering to mince words. Seriously, he really wanted to know. The term, ultimate defense, was really not supposed to be taken as a literal statement. My San Siyushi and the impact and everything else to go along with it. HN. And now your summon is gone, with you out of options. That was for the most part true. Sasuke still had more techniques left, more jutsu up his sleeve, but he couldn't do them without both hands. Hands as in plural, more than one, minimum of two. His hawk had saved his ass. Either way, he pulled his gun bay from his back and held it at the ready to do battle once more until he seemed to disappear in a torrent of petals. Okay. In a matter of seconds the petals all disappeared and Gara was left with the sight of his two siblings tied up with varying degrees of injuries having seemed to be dealt to them and quickly treated before they were moved to that spot. Kankuro was awake and seemingly cursing up a storm behind the gag that had been stuffed in his mouth and Tamari was still unconscious. Without moving from his spot initially, the red-haired, ring-eyed Jinchuriki noticed that Sasuke wasn't anywhere around anymore and he proceeded to uncharacteristically palm his face. They were so lucky he was past killing the whole killing them phase at this point. I didn't need your help. Sasuke insisted as he and the rest of Team 7 proceeded to run away from Gara after hoping that tending to his siblings would deter him from immediate pursuit. They didn't seem to be afraid of his presence anymore. So Sakura and Shuji felt that it was a possible out to break Sasuke out of situation, just heal my hand and let me go back. I'll finish it. He was not going to let it stand like that. He had him on the ropes. If he had his right hand back in action he'd be able to find a way to wrap it up. He knew he would. Gara was a man. Gara wasn't a machine. He could be hurt. Damn it, he'd taken forever to turn the tide of that fight and it was over just like that. He felt so robbed. That's not a good idea Sasuke could. Sakura replied, knowing that Sasuke's idea of finishing the battle would have been potentially lethal, even if Gara wasn't the one that would have wound up winning, even if this wasn't a fight we really started, if we wound up killing the Kaze Kage's children and the Jinchuriki of Shukaka that would end badly for Kanaha. Full-scale wars had been started over less after all. Besides, they needed to stop so that Sakura could apply a medical jutsu to his hand, and she and Shuji weren't particularly fans of staying still just in case Gara ignored Tamari and Kankuro and went ahead to chase after them. I hate running away from a fight I can win. 
Call it a strategic withdrawal then. Sakura snapped back in turn. This was not her night. Her relaxing bath had been interrupted and she hadn't even gotten five minutes to soak. Her hair got all wet. She had to fight against some seriously powerful wind ninjutsu and only won because Chuji was punctual and made for a seriously scary distraction when he needed to. Then Chuji insulted her winning ninjutsu. And all of that without getting a lick of sleep in almost 24 hours, and sunrise was going to be upon them within 3 hours, problem. So yes, she was rather miffed at tonight's turn of events. Sasuke just stared at her for several seconds until she turned to the side to glare right back at him. I think I liked it better when you'd just shut up and wouldn't argue with me. He then turned his eyes straight ahead when he swore that he saw her eyes roll hatefully into the back of her head. Can we just get back to Tsunade-sama now? Chuji asked, stomach growling at the fact that he'd missed his midnight meal due to their circumstances of having to run. Hi no Kuni countryside, with Tsunade and teammate. Kakuzu's fire mask seemed to only exist outside of his body for one reason and one reason only to seek and destroy Tsunade with extreme prejudice shooting off blast after blast of fiery chakra that erupted upon immediate contact with anything. So glad. Tsunade said tensely, literally outrunning the expanding flames of another shot that was aimed her way, I stayed in shape. Well what they say about you is true. Kakuza remarked, keeping his eyes locked on Tsunade to try and find an opening to attempt another attack on her while his fire mask tested her capabilities, you really are quite difficult to hit. She could dodge all she wanted as long as she didn't get close to him to try and lay him out with one of those killer punches of hers. And right on cue she diverted her path right in his direction, either to try and get close enough to hit him, or manipulate his stupid mask into shooting off Katon, Zokoku in his direction before she moved out of the way and left him to survive the shot somehow on his own. Not tonight. Of course, before he could do anything, his mindless mask proved itself as he had correctly perceived it to be as it let loose another fire attack at Tsunade's back. And that was fine, it was just that by the time it hit her it would be danger close to him as well. The look on her face told him that she knew that full well. The bitch, fine, let's play chicken. Kakuza thought to himself, waiting until the last possible moment before flipping through hand seals to stop her, Sutton, Sujin Hiki, water release, water encampment wall. Pulling down his face mask, Kakuza spewed out an obscene amount of water that blew out around him in a circular flowing pattern, highly forcefully. Tsunade was caught between a wall of water in front of her and an oncoming torrent of fire from behind her. When presented with that decision, there wasn't much of a choice to make. Tsunade punched at the oncoming water wave with one hand, the other one drawn back in preparation as if she knew that it wasn't going to stand up to her. Indeed it did not, as one punch from her split the flowing wall a path straight through to Kakuza while the fire behind her ran into the rest of it. A second punch soon followed that liquefied Kakuza's head. Well that wasn't right, water clone. Of course I knew you could muscle your way through that. Kakuza remarked from a different distance, your reputation really does precede you, a little too much in this case. You're much more impatient than Hashirama ever was. Kiss my ass you wrinkly ragdoll. Tsunade thought to herself at that very instant before she felt the presence of a second mask drifting around the battlefield, another one. Raiden, Jian, lightning release, false darkness. A second mask with a deformed bipedal form comprised of black threads charged electricity at its mouth, and Tsunade was surrounded by water from Kakuza's last jutsu that had been meant to defend him. The electricity fired off in a single straight bolt that was too slow to hit her directly. That was the reason for the water. There wasn't anywhere she could run fast enough to avoid the contact shock from the electricity touching the wet ground. Kakuza's abnormalized danced in mirth as sparks spread freely across the ground and Tsunade's body recoiled and went into spasms while she held back any sounds of pain and anguish she felt from the electricity passing through her muscles. Ah, it reminded him of money. Hinata and Shino would never claim to be experts in their field of the ninja arts. They had seen a lot since they had graduated from the academy, and they had had their share of successes and experiences, but seeing a man walk straight through fire as if it didn't bother him after watching Tsunade apparently kill him with the damnedest heel drop they'd ever seen kind of took the cake. Feh. He danced Pat, his own blood covering Tsunade's jacket that she'd thrown over his head to blind him before smashing him into the ground with her foot. 
He hurled the green apparel back into the fire that he'd just walked out of and faced down the two Kanahachunin that he'd wound up walking towards, since I've got to walk through more fire to get to your big tit babysitter that kicked me, I guess I'll just kill you two for now and hope there's some left when Kakuz is through with her. His cloak was in smoking, singed tatters, but he didn't seem to care one bit. The three-blade scythe in his hand was a little bit more important at the moment. I wonder. If I cut you in half would bugs fly out? He then asked bluntly, bloodthirsty eyes staring at Shino before he moved forward to attack him. I hope that you don't get to find out. Shino said, hands in the pockets of his hoodie as bugs filtered out of his clothes in abundance, Buswai no Jin, spindle formation. They flew at Hidan in a spiral motion to make their trajectory harder to anticipate. Immortal or not, if he didn't have any chakra, he wasn't going to be able to do anything, even move. Hidan licked his lips and didn't stop his rush, instead choosing to dive straight through the middle of Shino's spiral bug attack, leading with his scythe, gotcha brat. Upon reaching Shino he sliced him up, but instead of blood his body collapsed into a mass of insects, what the hell. Taking advantage of Shino's insect clone catching Hidan's attention, Akamaru dove at him, spinning like a drill to pulverize his body, but Hidan showed off incredible agility and acrobatic ability by deftly backflipping over and out of the way of the Ninkan's killer attack, not that it would have killed him, but it would have been very inconvenient. If he's really immortal? Hinata thought to herself as she moved in to attack him herself upon his landing, I might as well not even bother aiming for an organ. Shino-kun had the right idea in draining his chakra. As was previously stated, immortal or not, if he had no chakra he would be useless. Hidan caught her coming his way out of the corner of his eye and lashed out with his scythe, getting a few strands of her long hair when she ducked the move, Haka Kishao, a trigram's vacuum palm. With a thrust of her palm, Hinata blew him back and away with a strike without even hitting him with her hand. Little Hyuga bitch. Hidan complained as he flew through the air and righted himself upon landing, I'm so killing you first. Hinata wasn't so sure that she could risk an attack like that again. That scythe was long enough to give him the range that even a jutsu like the one she just used wouldn't be able to safely avoid each time, because it was still taijutsu and she needed to be close. He knew that too, because he was quick to attack her all over again. Shino hurled more insects his way, but a skillful mastery of his scythe allowed Hidan to fan them out of his way without breaking his stride one bit. It wasn't a matter of trapping or outsmarting a man such as this. That wasn't the issue for one as intelligent as Shino. What could you do when your enemy was such a berserker that it wasn't enough to do so? Hidan allegedly didn't have to worry about dying. And what stronger deterrent was there for a ninja to act than the threat of death? Instead of swinging his scythe normally, Hidan held onto the cable attached to the end of it and used it like a flail with odd angles of attack gifted to him via this method of battle. One particular patterned movement came dangerously close to hitting them both, barely splitting the ground between both Hinata and Shino. It was a move of misdirection however. When they both turned their eyes down to the blades stuck in the field the scythe was suddenly ripped back out, turning their gazes forward once more to see Hidan closer than they would have ever perceived that he could move in just one second. Until then his speed had been dangerous enough to take note of, but they had either severely misjudged his short-range swiftness or he'd been sandbagging intentionally the whole time. Either way, he was in with his weapon right back in his hand in a manic grin that let them know he was well aware of how much of a position he had on them. That was put on hold when he saw the living drill that was Akamaru moving on him again, that goddamned mutt. He then broke off and turned to block the Tsuaga with the pole of his scythe, being driven back before finally deflecting Akamaru off of him with great effort. But over the wall of flames all over the field came a second drill, coming in far faster than Akamaru had been. Hidan was aware of it and moved to dodge, but he was unable to evade it entirely and wound up getting the right side of his body caught up in the attack. After smashing Hidan into the ground, jumping out of the attack was Kiba, landing in a very heroic pose while breathing very heavily. He'd run all that way to catch up with them as fast as he could and was very pleased by his own timing. Seriously, he couldn't have timed that save any better if he'd been waiting for something like that to happen, feel free to worship me, now. Akamaru was not shy to do so, immediately bounding up to reunite with his partner. Kiba. Shino said, sounding somewhat relieved to find that he was alright and there to help, wait. We need you and Akamaru to go on ahead to the bounty station. What? 
He'd spent all of that time catching up to them and now he was supposed to go ahead? And what about the fight? They were all about to get filleted until he showed up, I just got here and you want me to run away. Keeble licked away his own blood from three long cuts he'd received on his arm during his attack against Hedan, give me one good reason. You're the fastest. Out of all of us. Even the people that aren't here. Okay, that was a very good reason. But what about that guy? Kiba asked, pointing at Hidan who was beginning to get back up, that should have killed him. Why didn't that kill him? He seemed significantly alarmed by that. Because he's immortal. And you're sure you want me to leave? Kiba kun Hinata said, grabbing a hold of his arm to make sure she had his attention, if all of us stayed here but none of us could kill him anyway, what would that accomplish? He seemed at a loss and blinked in confusion, at this point, all we can do is keep him at bay and hope that Tsunade Sama can defeat her opponent. Maybe they could incapacitate Hidan, maybe they couldn't. But that wasn't the point. Someone had to make sure the mission got accomplished. Shikamaru and he had split up the moment he realized that the team had fractured off, separating Team 10 from Team 8 and Tsunade, so that meant that they were the group that was the farthest forward, and that would look to him being the lead man going to the bounty station. Go, and remove the bounty from Tsunade-sama. Hinata urged him, turning off her Byakugan momentarily to look at him meaningfully, we'll catch up with you when this is over, or you can return after you've finished. Trust us. Kiba frowned but nodded and whistled for Akamaru before both of them took off back through the wall of fire that spanned most of the battlefield, you guys had better not do something stupid like get killed. He shouted back as he left them. There wasn't a clan in Kanaha that knew of Hino Kuni's backwoods and wilderness than the Inuzuka. Traveling with everyone else was probably just slowing Kiba down. Alone he'd knock off a quarter of the time he'd have made moving with others at the same distance pace. Hidan's entire right side was badly torn up by Kiba's last attack, how many of you vermin are gonna come out? He asked blood pouring down half of his body entirely, any other surprises? Anyone else planning on dropping in that I don't fucking know about? No? Okay, let's get to the fun part. In his left hand he held up his scythe that had some blood on the blades and proceeded to lick the red fluid off. Hinata held her hand up to her mouth in shock at seeing someone actually ingest an enemy's blood like that. What was with these people? One with five hearts and a body composition of black threads inside, the other unkillable and bloodthirsty, literally. These weren't humans. They couldn't be. And when Hidan started drawing some strange circle on the ground and his skin change appearance altogether she felt serious belief in this fact, Jujitsu, Shiji Hyokutsu, Curse Technique, Death Controlling Possessed Blood. Miles away, decrepit fishing village, with Team 10. Okay. So almost knocking Derui into the next life with pure taijutsu and clone tricks pissed him off. Good to know. He had a strong ninjutsu base, and this was coming from Naruto of all people. Sudden, Hahanryu, water release, tearing torrent. A whirl of water formed in Derui's right hand before he shot it out at Naruto in a powerful burst that the latter dodged. It wound up plowing its way through every single shack and homes and home in its way plowing straight into the nearby massive lake that was a geographical trait of the area. Naruto was impressed, and that wasn't a good thing. Splinters, dust, and old loose fishing equipment flew through the air, clouding the vision of both Naruto and Derui until a gleam of steel could be seen behind Naruto. Pulling his machete's blade from the sheath on his back just enough to protect his neck, Naruto blocked a swing of Amwa's katana that would have beheaded him. He never thought that he would be the one to complain about something like this, but fighting more than one opponent was annoying. One was very powerful, and the other one was dangerous enough that he couldn't ignore him or he'd lose his head. Naruto aggressively kicked Omoe away hard enough to send him sliding right into the lake with a crash, through the pathway that Derui's previous jutsu had created in the small ghost town. You can't have Tsunade Bachin. Naruto said, taking his machete back out and pointing it right at Derui, she wouldn't come with you, so just go home. I'm totally serious and I'm about to get pissed. We've been getting chased by Iwaambu, you, and Suna ninjas all night long. I'm so not in the mood to do this right now. Ino was busy fighting with two other Kumogaku or Kunoichi, and who knew what else was happening wherever other bad things were going on. Sorry, but why should I care if you're in a bad mood kid? 
Darui asked, holding up his large cleaver sword to prepare another attack again, that doesn't mean anything when it comes to bailing on our mission. The boss would kill us if we just quit like that, and we've got the numbers on you and your girlfriend. Why don't you just quit? At that moment, Ino's battle against Samui and Karui could be seen by the two men with the three women darting over the rooftops, do you really want to take your chances four on two? Ino seemed to be doing okay since Karui appeared to be utterly focused on getting close enough to cut her down with her sword. The Yamanaka girl was extremely light on her feet in staying away from the attack, lithe, like a dancer even. He hadn't seen her in battle since returning to Kanaha, and she was stunning. So graceful. So much more confident now when it came to her every move. So completely certain that Karui would not, could not hit her. That she was in full control even though the numbers were against her. She was beautiful. And Darui could see, even in Naruto's passing glance in the direction of Ino and his own two Kumo teammates, that he was captivated by the girl. A target was presented. At best it would end the battle altogether. At worst it would throw Naruto off so badly mentally that he would never recover and would be easy pickings from that point forward. He was talented but he was young, and a young ninja could easily become compromised by his own emotions. All you had to do was find their berserk button. His was more than likely going to be the pretty little thing fending off Karui and Samui. The look in his eyes was something that he couldn't hide from a shinobi as attentive as him, he was sweet on her. Getting Naruto's attention once more. Darui quickly rolled through four hand seals before holding his hands in the final dragon seal, a circle of bright energy surrounded his hands before even more covered them, sorry, but we're getting what we need to get. No matter what they had to do, Rantan, Riza Sakaso, Storm Release, Laser Circus. What the hell is a storm release? Naruto thought to himself, preparing to move in order to avoid any potential attack coming his way. From his hands, through the aiming point of the halo, Darui fired off more than a dozen trailing, flowing beams that Naruto didn't even have to avoid. They bypassed him completely, missing entirely, and moving past him to target Ino. Who was unaware that they were headed for her. It was a shot that was at least 50 yards away, and she was involved with her own problems at the moment, so she wasn't exactly knowledgeable of something coming her way from such a long range, from Naruto's opponent especially. Ino. Naruto shouted as loud as he could muster desperate for her to hear him and find some way to avoid an attack with so many angles on her that she wouldn't have had much of a chance if she'd seen it coming in the first place. She turned upon hearing Naruto's voice yell for her and saw the many laser blasts coming her way from Darui. Her mouth opened in a gasp and she tried to feel for something around that could help her, but her ninjutsu skills weren't destructive enough to dredge up a move that could stop such a thing. She wasn't a powerhouse of a ninja like Naruto was. Her life flashed before her eyes in the blur of the lights coming her way. And then she found the building she was standing on collapsing, sending her down to the ground below and forcing Darui's attack to miss. Inexplicably, that and four other entire buildings found themselves sliced down by the foundations. Ugh. A rather disgruntled yet lazy voice said, slowly walking onto the scene while holding his fingers in a rat seal, did I really have to blow my whole element of surprise to save Eno like that? Shikamaru's shadow slinked back over to him, reeling back in from where he had used it to cut down the flimsy dwellings that Ino and the Kumo girls had been fighting on. Good old Shikamaru. Reliable as hell when it counted. Naruto's relief quickly gave way to mounting anger as he glared back at Darui and formed a Rasengan in his hand in preparation to attack, that jutsu. That's the Yondaime Hokage's signature move isn't it? This kid knows it. It was pretty surprising but it was also a well-known melee attack. He had to get close enough to touch him with it for it to do anything. Naruto wasn't focusing on him though, instead holding out his right hand toward the lake that he'd knocked Omoe into, he added a second hand behind the first and the Rasengan began to take a warped form as he blew ash onto it. It began to develop a gray shell, cracked with specks of hot orange in it, like a dying planet with a visible blue core inside of it. My turn. He said with a flash of red to his eyes before they turned back to blue, Raisin Teki Don, spiraling grenade. With one might push of both hands, Naruto sent his strange jutsu out at Omoe who just gotten out of the water and was clearing his cobwebs on the WH air from Naruto's earlier landed blow. Much like Ino, he did not see this one coming. Unlike Ino however, 
there was no one that could move him aside or distort the battlefield in some way to save him. The Raisin Techie Dawn detonated upon contact with the first thing that it touched, blowing up the entire WH Airf and what was on it in a powerful shockwave that sent ash billowing out from the center of impact. A large, black soot figure flew out and fell into the water with a splash, and nothing moved from there from that point forward until a body could be seen floating on the surface of the water. When Naruto turned his eyes back to face the stunned Jonin that he'd been locked in battle with moments before, Darui was forced to look into his eyes which told the whole story, just like they had before to how he was enamored with Eno. Only this time they spoke in a different kind of manner than the fondness for another that they'd once held. You started this when you attacked us. You escalated this when you attacked her. So I'll finish this by any means necessary. Those eyes couldn't hide any secrets. Not that he was trying to hide in the least what he was thinking at the moment. How could you? Darui started to say before glaring hatefully at Naruto. If that was really the route that this fight was going to go dash, he never saw it coming. He was defenseless. Ino wouldn't have seen it coming either. Naruto snapped in return, a blood-red cloak of chakra covering his body with two tails of energy visible behind him. His physical features roughened and turned more feral right before Darui's eyes, now take him and leave, or shut up and fight. He barked with a gravelly tint to his voice, you can't just change the rules back whenever you feel like it asshole. You started this. Surprise filled Darui's eyes at the sight of an aggressively assumed chakra cloak for Naruto. He couldn't be the right-hand man of the Raikage without knowing what that was from personal experience, and it left in him a feeling of having screwed up that he couldn't shake, a Jinchuriki. This is the Kanaha Kyuba Jinchuriki. Granted, he wasn't as famous as the Jinchuriki of most other villages since Kanaha had done a very good job of keeping him as under wraps as they could. But even so, there was no way Omoe would have been ready to face someone like that, even if they'd known that they'd be stepping on one's toes during the course of this mission. Still, he was a kid. And he wasn't as completely comfortable in his own skin so to speak as Killer B would have been. He was strong enough to handle taking Naruto on. He knew that he was, he just couldn't fight with revenge on his mind or he'd wind up playing into the hands of what a Jinchuriki specialized in, toe-to-toe -to -toe slugfests. Whatever you want kid. Darui said, face hardening into a stony expression, show me what you've got. Both of Naruto's chakra tails shot forward on both sides of Darui to pincer him in while Naruto himself came straight down the middle for a three-pronged attack. Darui readied himself to move while whipping through more hand seals before he jumped directly into the air to avoid Naruto's three-sided attack. That wasn't going to stop anything though. All it would do was postpone Naruto's barrage until he fell back down to the ground. That was what the jutsu was for, Rantan, Rainbow in Zaidaku, Storm Release, Rainbow in the Dark. Quicker than the last one, Darui formed the light around his hands and threw it down at Naruto, not surprised at all when he dashed aside and dodged it. That was not the point of the jutsu. It hit the ground, but instead of exploding or just vanishing it began to spin before letting off dozens of small beams in every direction, quickly sinking up to target Naruto and pursue him. If Darui's last attack against Ino was inescapable, Naruto had perhaps thought prematurely as all he could do was turtle up defensively while they started blasting off of his form. From his point of view, Darui watched his jutsu faithfully chase Naruto down and hammer him relentlessly with so many of the small village's hovels and shacks being annihilated in the process. When the smoke cleared, nothing of those things would remain. Three quarters of the ghost town was now destroyed as a result of the battle, and his jutsu wasn't even finished yet. Naruto. Ino cried out now that the shoe was apparently on the other foot and Darui was blowing him into the next life as opposed to him doing it to her. Her initial wish was to get up to try and attack Darui herself, but she found herself more concerned with rolling out of the way of a sword strike that cut an entire building in twain. He'll get what he deserves and more. Karui exclaimed gripping the handle of her sword so hard that her hands were actually bleeding onto the ground, I guess Kumo really is the only village with a Jinchuriki that isn't a soulless killer. Well at least they've forgotten about Tsunade Sama for now. Ino thought to herself. And anger was always an emotion that she could take advantage of, Goldie Kun isn't soulless. For what? Doing what that other guy was going to do to me anyway. That was different. Like hell it was. Still angered, Karui attacked Ino directly, looking to cut her asunder with her katana. 
The lovely Yamanaka girl formed two quick hand seals and inhaled deeply, Dakujuri, poison mist. A dark fog spewed from Ino's mouth, but Kurui was quick enough to move out of the way of the airborne substance. She didn't realize that Ino had expected her to avoid that move the entire time, and angled her attack so that she was forced to go in one direction instead of another. A direction where Ino was already aiming with something else altogether. Upon avoiding Ino's poison, all Kurui got was a quick view of Ino's hands held in a new hand seal that made it look like she was taking aim at something. Her. Amwa's death made her emotional enough to forget Samui's original advice in dealing with her at the outset of the battle, Shintenshin no Jutsu, Mind Body Switch Jutsu. Kurui's body stopped moving forward mid-stride and violently jerked involuntarily upon having Ino's consciousness supplant hers so that the latter could have complete control of her body. Ino's own body collapsed to the ground, fainting due to the current lack of a cognizant mind in it. Dropping the katana and looking at her hands as she got her bearings quickly within Kurui's body, Ino then frowned as she got a feel for what she had to offer, I think I was better off staying in my own body. In the entire block of wrecked homes that Shikamaru had destroyed the foundations of to bail Ino out of danger from Derui's jutsu, the lazy genius managed to locate Samui lying amongst the wreckage of one of them with a rather large shard of jagged wood piercing her left leg. She wasn't making any loud noises to reveal the kind of pain that she was in, but she would let out little sharp intakes of air to bite back any outcries that might have occurred. It was a very nasty wound and she was doing what she could to nurse it on the spot. Her eyes tilted up to see Shikamaru crouching down just staring at her with an unreadable expression on his face. The fact that it was still extremely dark in the early dawn probably didn't help her try to read his expression, so, are you going to kill me? Like how Naruto killed Omoe. Surrender and I won't. Shikamaru said, I really don't want to have to, but... He pointed at the sash around his waist before forming a few more hand seals, me and Naruto? They really made us not care about killing the people we have to fight since they'd kill us first. So I'll do it and won't lose a wink of sleep over it. Omoe was dead. Kurui was indisposed. She couldn't walk, much less run or fight on her injured leg. Derui was the only one of them left and he was still dealing with Naruto. As angry as she was that her teammate had been ended, she had to stay cool. There rightfully wasn't anything that she herself could do to make these people pay. That, and Shikamaru's shadow seemed to be setting up to impale her from many different directions in the dark, and you'll allow us to leave. If you leave now? Yes. Ino will stay in that girl's body and take you and yours as far as she can before letting her go of her jutsu. As I am I can't walk. At that moment, a loud noise sounded out from the direction of the lake that the town was initially built right by. No one else was really aware of what it meant, but Shikamaru was. He'd only seen it in person once, but one time was all he needed to remember the feeling that came with it for life. Then you'd better hope Naruto's feeling in control enough to win without killing your other friend. He wouldn't count on it though. Not with the track record that came with it. Moments earlier, nearby. Derui's self-sustaining Rantanjutsu eventually ran out of juice and left the battlefield a smoking, battered mess. But he could still feel that same pressure of anger and harm coming from nearby. It didn't take a sensor at all to locate Naruto. Anyone with half a feeling for malevolent chakra could feel out his foul signature. Standing out on the lake itself was Naruto, only now he had a third tail available to his fox chakra shroud. His eyes were pure blood red and the entire form seemed to be bubbling. The water around him directly appeared to be beginning to boil and push waves away from his body just from him standing there. Focus. Naruto thought to himself. Trying to control his own breathing at all costs, you're fine. This isn't as far as you can go. Just be cool. Few taught him that pure willpower and experience was what it took to control a Biju's chakra, and Jiraiya made sure that he learned how to center himself and remain calm on each stage of drawing upon the power before he ever wanted to see him practicing fighting with it. Didn't hurt. Naruto blatantly lied before letting out a cough as his body betrayed him. The chakra had patched up all of the injuries that Derui's last non-stop jutsu had dealt him and the cloak itself had protected him from quite a bit of devastation. But it most assuredly had hurt. Very much so. Then why did you tap into more chakra? Derui asked dully as he walked closer to the site of the fight, I know what the tales mean kid. 
Killer B is Kumo Gakur's perfect Jinchuriki key that can use his Biju's full power. You can barely tolerate as much as you are using right now. Well maybe his Biju isn't a douche like mine is. Naruto replied, feeling a pull on his own chakra from inside and he knew what the reasoning was, what? You know I'm right. You're a jerk even when I try to be nice to you. You know what'd really be nice? Letting me out you whelp. But then I'd die. Well wouldn't that just be a national tragedy? Internal sarcasm aside, there was a conflict still going on. And Derui was wary, but he didn't seem concerned. Naruto wasn't flying off the handle the way that most of history's Jinchuriki were noted for doing when tapping into their fowler chakra. Yet at least. That wasn't a good thing. He wanted him to lose control. Tell me. Derui said to Naruto who seemed to tilt his head at being asked a question in the midst of their battle, do you know what chakra natures you need to create storm release? All he got in return was a look from Naruto, exhibiting that he didn't care, water, and lightning. Really? Well it sounded appropriate, but Naruto didn't feel like he'd been getting shocked when it hit him, you've already seen that I can use one. And guess where you are? On a dim lake. Naruto and Derui seemed to be at a momentary standoff, until Naruto ran for shore as fast as possible, whether Derui was there or not. He saw the man quickly making five hand seals and forced all three of his chakra tails forward to drill into him to intercept whatever move he was about to make. Derui had to make an audible and drew the cleaver sword from his back to swing at Naruto's chakra arms, cutting through them with the lightning-infused blade before throwing it into the water. The discharge stopped Naruto in his tracks before his sandaled feet could touch solid ground, grey ah <laughs> Lightning was officially his least favorite element. It was the fastest out of the five, and the only thing that hurt more was fire. He was quite certain that in another reality his dislike for lightning would remain the same for an entirely different reason, but for now he could definitely say that it altogether sucked. He won't die. Derui thought to himself, watching Naruto scream in pain and still remain standing atop the water without a heel or an ankle submerging beneath. He was still able to keep his chakra under enough control to water walk, it shouldn't be this difficult to finish someone. His hands met in the ram seal as he started drawing upon so much chakra that it was visible and black, even a Jinchuriki. He had to hurry and kill him. Naruto's own chakra output had grown so intensely visible that his own skin began to burn from it. A black sphere of energy surrounded his body, and broke open with a massive roar slash yell, that could have echoed out for miles. From his body, Derui forced out a large amount of black lightning chakra that took the form of a massive panther, bigger than the first by three times. It looked as if it were alive as it went straight for Naruto. That roar let Derui know that Naruto had lost it. He'd gone berserk, and now was the time to strike at him and end the battle. Once his ability to reason was lost, the instinct to destroy that made up for it simply wouldn't be enough. Instead of staying in the water, Naruto's form leapt high into the air, far over Derui's head, and landing on the ground hard enough to break a crater into it upon impact. A massive amount of lake water was covered in black jolts of lightning from where his attack had spaced out upon missing Naruto. But Derui would wait and prepare another black lightning ninjutsu. He would wait for the berserker rush from the lost Jinchuriki, however it never came. There was no desperate rush from Naruto to claim his life. He was just standing there, shaking every few seconds. Naruto's chakra cloak mixed with his own blood to give it an eerie black and red glow, shaped in a more streamlined fox formation around his body. His eyes were solid white. His teeth were bared, but he wasn't snarling, nor was he hunched or raging. He was entirely focused on his breathing, and it was apparently hard to keep level from the sound of it. Yeah. Naruto said, with a drastically warped voice that seemed to be marred with unseen suffering, try that black lightning stuff now. He said as all four of his chakra tails shot out in corner positions and began to rotate around like blades on a fan, smashing through the ground easily to make extra space for easier spinning, I dare you. Omake, Guardian Days 11. Two years and two months after Shikamaru and Naruto's acceptance. Let me get up. Naruto complained. He'd been confined to his room in the Guardian quarters for two days after a little. Incident occurred a few miles away from the capital city. Luckily Jiraiya had the practiced foresight to take him far, far away from civilization before making him push certain limitations of his, come on. I'm fine. 
All of your skin burned off. Shizuna said, sitting guard nearby Naruto's bed with Tonton. A watch needed to be kept over him lest he find some way to escape again. For an added measure he was sealed in with tags on the four corners of the bottoms of his bed and the ceiling. He wasn't good enough at Fuinjutsu yet to break it from the inside himself even though his hands were free, you're not getting out of that bed until Tsunade-sama gives the okay. Jiraiya was a jerk sometimes. And all of the other guardians sucked too, Shikamaru included, for not letting him out. He tried to summon something so that he could send a message to Gamakaki to reverse summon him out, but the barrier blocked space-time ninjutsu. I don't remember that. Of course you wouldn't from what we heard. What happened? You kind of almost rampaged toward a village and destroyed it. Shizuna seemed extremely uncomfortable in informing him of that fact, as signified by the shifting of her heeled sandaled feet even while sitting still in her chair. Even Tonton oinked concernedly. Naruto didn't say anything, because how the hell did you respond to something like that? So that was what Jiraiya and Fu had always kept talking about when they said that he could wind up relinquishing control of the Kubia's chakra? Yeah, it had been difficult to keep his head when he started using more, but he never figured he'd actually lose it. Wow. Uh. Naruto said, licking his lips while wondering what to say next, well, I've just got to learn how to work it out and control it to that point then don't I? He asked, trying to keep things positive while wondering just what kind of a beast he became when he'd gone under, the next time I'll dash dot. No. Shizuna said, immediately cutting him off, no, 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 no. No next time for that. Never again. Do you know what you did to yourself, aside from going on a tear? The blank look on Naruto's face answered the question, your chakra was so intense that it burned through your skin. You were destroying your own body and healing it so quickly, the constant creation and destruction of new cells shortened your life. But I'm an Uzumaki, so. That doesn't mean you can just cut chunks of years off of your life whenever you feel like it. Shizune actually got up and threw her own chair at Naruto, and because the seal only stopped things from getting out and not from getting in, so that they could feed him amongst other things, it sailed in but didn't get out again, much to Naruto's consternation, Kami, you're just as bad as Tsunade-sama. You two really are related to each other. She realized that she'd presented Naruto with some extremely new information that she wasn't the one to rightfully inform him about. All he did was stare at her with a wide-eyed, confused expression, say what now? Shizuna just started edging her way out of Naruto's room with Tonton in grasp, I'll go get her. I think she'd be better to talk to you about this than me. As curious as he was, Naruto accepted this. Shizuna wasn't a pass the buck kind of person and had his complete, unconditional trust, thus he accepted this. Even so, okay, but can I ask a question before you leave? Yes. Why is she here? The she in question was the Shizuka girl that wanted to take him home with her not too long ago. Word had it that she'd been hanging around in the capital after their first run-in, but he hadn't seen her since. And yet here she sat, confidently in Siza at the foot of his bed, looking right at him with an unreadable expression of partiality in her eyes. Shizuna pitted the boy, but there was a reason for it, she is a high-ranking diplomat from Nadeshiko village, so she was able to negotiate a stay within the court as a good faith guest of the fire daimyo. Damn it. That old man was so easy to sway with pretty words. He was a nice guy and good at his job of ruling more often than not, but any half-assed speaker could influence him if there wasn't anyone to go against them. Shizuna wished him luck and left Naruto alone to go retrieve Tsunade. The girl couldn't get him out of his temporary prison without a relatively good mastery of Fuinjutsu, and even if she did, absconding with Naruto like a thief in the night would be next to impossible. All Naruto could do was sit in his bed and stare at the dark and lovely girl with an odd method of obtaining a spouse, so. Naruto started to say, not wanting the awkward, in his opinion, silence to continue any further, you didn't go home. I can do no such thing until I've determined that my would-be husband is unworthy by defeating him. Shizuka said, lowering her head slightly in what could be perceived as a momentary bow, but I accept the fact that you are more powerful than Miyazumaki-san. Oh. Naruto had to find a way to excuse himself, because his ego was showing, really? Nah. Well, go on if you insist. He said, almost preening like a peacock despite being confined to the limits of a king-sized bed, 
Tell me more. Really? I cannot defeat a Jinchurik key that can do what you managed to do to the countryside. Shizuka conceded freely, green eyes never leaving his form, that asserts that you are the stronger of us. My efforts will now be focused on getting you to return to the village with me. We will be wed as soon as possible. Okay, that really made him lose the overinflated self-esteem and then some. She already didn't seem to care that he figured that he would be a terrible significant other, so he had to try to appeal to other avenues of escaping this fate, what if I said I had a girlfriend already? A fire set itself in Shizuka's eyes as she brandished a trio of kunai between her fingers, then I will have to emphasize to her that I am the only kunoichi worthy of betrothal to someone this strong. Do not concern yourself with such a trifle. I know that you will be very happy once we return home. What is this girl's name? No. I am not going to some other village, especially one with customs like this. Naruto thought to himself frantically. Granted, at the moment he was totally safe, since she couldn't just snatch him up and leave lest she begin a war, but she could always talk the fire daimyo into it. That was a very realistic and terrifying chance. So what is the name of this other girl so that I may prove my superiority over her? Naruto's first idea was to say Kotoko, but that would be infinitely too vindictive. It would solve his problem more than likely, but it was far too cruel of a fate to inflict on a young woman just trying to fulfill the customs of her home. No one deserved to die like that, even if he had been in the malicious mindset of putting Shizuka to sleep forever, which he wasn't. Kotoko would try to butcher her from the outset without even asking why she'd been challenged or attacked, and she'd do it with a lovely smile on her face that would make it all the more chilling. So why do that? But she was waiting on an answer, eyes filled with hope that it would be something she could handle that would prove to him that being wed to her would be for the best for the both of them. He had to give her something. Even if it was something that she could never try to go for, for whatever reason. And only one name filled his head due to some of the letters that he could still see on his nightstand by the bed. Eno. Naruto eventually said, trying to keep an even expression on his face to hide the outright lie, her name is Eno. Any further conversation had to come to a close as the door opened to reveal Jiraiya poking his head in, you. Yes, me. Jiraiya deadpanned as he walked into the room. Is that how you thank the man that risked life and limb to keep you from renaming a village into Big Smoking Crater in the Ground? No, that's how I thank the man that got me engaged. Naruto replied, crossing his arms over his chest, I mean it's not her fault, and it isn't mine either. Seriously, what am I gonna do, stop being awesome? I feel the same way every day. Jiraiya replied, noticing that the Nades Hiko village girl was still sitting Siza on the floor in front of Naruto's bed. MMM. He said to himself, sizing up the lovely young lady. And she actually openly wanted to get with his student? You know, if you did go I could still train you and everything. I can go wherever and do whatever I want after all dash dot. In response, Shizuka's eyes lit up and Naruto leapt at Jiraiya with intent to tear him apart, but the seal holding up the barrier around his bed came into play and an invisible wall caused him to collide with seemingly nothing head first. The chair that Shizune had thrown at him earlier then came into play when he picked it up and tried to break free of his jail with an impromptu weapon. I came here to let him out since Tsunade Hime finished checking over the damage that the four-tailed form does to him. Jiraiya thought, stroking his chin in contemplation while Naruto continued to wail away at nothing with a piece of small furniture, but if I let him out he's just gonna come after me with that chair, and I don't want to beat his ass right now. Jiraiya mindlessly touched at a still fresh and source car that lay behind the confines of his shirts. Maybe loosening the seal for access to more power wasn't the best idea yet? Because he was extremely aggressive. Oh well. He'd get over it. That's it for part 27. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.